message is being broadcast by the Department of Defense of the Republic. At 2 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, multiple unidentified objects were confirmed to have entered Earth's atmosphere. Discovery Houston, 20 seconds to LOS Tetris. The first message that comes to you is you are a divine being. You matter. You count. You come from realms of unimaginable power and light, and you will return to those realms. The vast stretches of the unknown and the unanswered and the unfinished still far outstripped our collective comprehension. Broadcasting from Forest Tower Studios, all the way from the Deep South. Now, here is your host, Joe Root. Good evening, everybody. I'm Joe Root, and this is Lighting the Void. It is Thursday night, January 17th, on into the 18th, and we are live on KTLK Digital Broadcast on the Fringe FM, and our website is lightingthevoid.com. You can call into the show uh, when we open the phone lines up, which would be 1-800-588-0335, probably towards the second part of the show. And also you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. That's all the social media that we do. And if you would like to text in, it's 501-777-5631. You can also email the show at contact at lightingthevoid.com. Tonight, we're going to have a discussion about UFOs. It's been a long time since we've talked about this topic, and our guest tonight is a very special guest, Dr. Irina Scott, and we're going to be discussing her book, Sacred Corridor, Secrets Behind the Real Project Blue Book, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Roswell, and uh, Memory Metal. We're going to talk about Dr. J. Allen Hynek and also some UFO cover-ups. And uh, I told you we'd get back on the subject. I know we've been talking about consciousness so much, and... uh, it's one of those deals where I want to try to put this stuff together. So here we go, right? This is our first time talking about it this year in 2019. I want to say, uh, give a special shout out to Eric. He's going to be with us later on in the show. So that's cool. It's been a while since we heard from Markham. And I also want to thank uh, Eric TC last night for doing the show about his tarot deck, as well as some of the new art he's going to be doing for the show, which I've kind of... I guess previewed. I gave you a preview of that on social media. Now, a little bit about our guest. Dr. Irina Scott received her Ph.D. from the University of Missouri College of Veterinary Medicine and Physiology. She also did post her postdoctoral research at Cornell University and has had a professorship at St. Bonaventure University. Her master's was from the University of Nevada, her bachelor's from Ohio State uh, University in Astronomy, and biology, and she has done research and teaching at the Ohio State University College of Medicine and the University of Nevada. The Defense Intelligence Agency, or the DIA, employed her in a PhD level, or what's known as GS-11 level of research in satellite photography, including in its air order of battle section, which involved aircraft identification with above top secret security clearances. She was employed in in as a physical scientist or cartographer in the DMA Aerospace Center or Aerospace Center using satellite photography. And she worked at uh, Battelle Memorial Institute. She has been sent for work-related purposes to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. She was a volunteer astronomer at the Ohio State University Radio Observatory, the Big Ear, noted for the wow steady signal that uh, might be humanity's only signal from E.T., She's also an amateur astronomer and has taken flying lessons. She was a correspondent for Popular Mechanics magazine, and her publications include books and works in peer-reviewed scientific journals, magazines, and newspapers. Her photography has been shown on television and in magazines, books, and newspapers. She served on the MUFON Board of Directors from 1993 to 2000 and is a MUFON consultant in physiology and astronomy and a field investigator. Now, as the MUFON Director of Publications, she co-edited eight symposium proceedings, including several of the most important MUFON publications. She was a founding member of the Mid-Ohio Research Association and an editor for the Ohio UFO Notebook. 
Her UFO publications include numerous articles in the MUFON UFO Journal, the International UFO Reporter, and Fate Magazine. She has taken a scientific approach to UFO phenomena and published papers about UFO data in peer-reviewed scientific journals, including the American Association for the Advancement of Science Publications. And this is cool. So thank you so much. That's pretty impressive, uh, Dr. Scott. I really appreciate you coming on the show. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here. Well, I'm very happy to have you. I figure if we're going to start talking about UFOs this year, why not kick it off with somebody with a a decent background in this study? But I do got to ask you before we go down this road, you got a great education. I told you before the show started that I was intimidated by it, right? Always, I'm always intimidated by super educated people, but that's okay. Uh, after all this study that you've done, what is there anything definitive other than, yes, UFOs are real that you can tell us about UFOs, or is it still just a great mystery? To me, after many years of studying and thinking about it and everything, it's still a great mystery to me. I really don't know, have any idea what they are. Um, Isn't that something? I've sort of concluded that they're um, just like a, <laughs> just like where you um, don't know what's going on, um, like the supernatural, except that that's basically just what you don't know, and I don't know what UFOs are. So I'm not too illuminating on that. Well, yeah, well, that's at least you're honest about it. That's that's what I like. Because we get a lot of mishmash in this field. Like there's a lot of people out there, dabblers, even when it comes to the fields of consciousness, everything. Everybody's got all the answers, what they really are. But when you look at people that actually really study these thing, these things, like um, a friend of mine, Tim Doyle from UFO Seekers, they're out in the field all the time you know, taking pictures and looking at this stuff and more than anybody I know personally. Right. And they don't have a clue what some of the stuff is other than the military craft that they have actually taken footage of. It's just a big mystery to them as well. Well, it certainly is to me. I know characteristics of them and things like that, but so far as a general idea, it's very mysterious because it seems to be like, something psychological and something physical at the same time. And that's um, difficult to understand. So did you, were you, you weren't interested in this. You could, you got kind of pulled into this, right? Or were you interested in this and worked your way into the DIA? Because I'm real curious how someone gets into the department of intelligence. Well, the way I got in was I had always been interested in astronomy since I was very young and um, I majored in it in college, but when I went to look for jobs, I couldn't get any. I couldn't even get an application because the jobs were male only back then. And so anyway, I was kind of looking for a place to get in some way, and they were hiring females as cartographers or mappers at um, the Aerospace Center in St. Louis. And they were also mapping the moon and planets and things like that. And I thought, well, that's pretty close to astronomy. And so I got into that. But then I got my security, my first security clearances, and they were pretty high. And so instead of mapping the moon, I was stuck on Earth and doing military type mapping. And then later, I was still kind of seeing if I could move around and get into something I was a little more interested in. And so I had the opportunity to uh, uh, transfer to the DIA in Washington, D.C. And But this turned out the same way. I got a very high security clearance above top secret, and I wound up with military work using satellite photography on Earth instead of other plants what I, that are what I wanted to get into. Hey, so that's how I got. That's that's interesting. So it's not as it's it's not as uh, I guess you could say fantastical as a lot of people like to think. Some people just end up in this because of their education, right? That's just how you get in. Um, 
But I think yeah, a lot of times what people worry about is, and what I worry about, uh, Dr. Scott, is I know most people are going to say, never trust the government. Don't trust the government. Don't trust them with anything. But to be honest with you, I'd like to be able to trust him with something, you know? And with this subject, I don't. Even when they came out in 2017 with the gimbal footage, I still felt like um, that they were just giving us a cookie, basically, and saying, here you go, yes, we've done this, and here's the little bit of money, which I, to me that's a small amount of money, $22 million or whatever, just to kind of get some people to back off. And since then, other than this Bob Lazar story thing, it's still... I mean, I don't feel like we've had disclosure. Do you? No. Um, I think probably deep in the government there's something going on. But um, I think it's deeper than what they've disclosed as, and put up as um, a real disclosure. So I think there's lots of government people that are honest and nice people and everything. Mm-hmm. But I think there's... Uh, the UFO subject is kind of hidden somewhere. And when I was looking through your uh, book here, uh, Sacred Corridors, and you've written many books about cover-ups, I think that what ends up happening and what I'm getting a pattern of from here is a little bit of frustration from you. As, you know, just when you're getting somewhere or, or asking a certain question, even a I guess a reasonable question about some of this stuff, they just cover it up or they don't study it anymore. They, they want to just shut the case down, which was, I think if you can correct me if I'm wrong here is making you feel like there's something in the government besides what we know, just covering all this stuff up. Right. Yes. And I, due to working for the DIA, I had some experience there that made me think that even high up, uh, um, They're covering things up. Um, I had a code word clearance, which is above top secret. But I found out in the government, if you have a high clearance, that it just goes for what the particular code word you're working on. You don't have a clearance over everything. I suppose you get higher and higher. It includes more things. But, um, for example, if people are working on UFOs and there's a particular code word. Well, other people with different code words couldn't know anything about it. So, you know, it's possible even that the president doesn't know about it. What about, what about in your opinion, uh, groups like Majestic 12 and things of that nature? Did you get any inkling that there was somebody, like, I don't know how far you got into this, but did you get any idea or any inkling that there was another a sect in our government that we just aren't aware of? With the MJ-12, I never saw anything that confirmed any of the documents. There's real good documents, and they will make you think, boy, you really have something here, but there's no way to ever uh, verify them. And so I didn't spend too much time on them because I worked for the government, and I knew what government documents were. And you should be able to verify things some way. And with that, I just saw no way to verify anything. So I didn't spend much time on it. I mean, I've read about it and everything. And I think the documents look good. And I don't know why anybody, you know, go to that much trouble faking documents, but it looks like maybe they are. Right. Yeah. And your experience do... um... And this is this is my theory, so you don't have to try to validate it at all. But in your experience, do a lot of the UFOs that we see, this is my experience with the community, okay? A lot of people see things in the sky, and they see a blinking light or something, or they'll see a, a UFO, and the light will kind of phase up a little bit, and automatically it's a UFO, and it's got aliens on it. you know. And I'm thinking, well, a UFO is an unidentified flying object, Let's kind of. That doesn't mean there's aliens on it, but do you, do a lot of craft get mistaken just for military craft? In your opinion? Yeah, I think so. Uh, they did a study, and I think that um, about um, two thirds of them were just ones where they explored farther. They 
that the person had misidentified him some way. But there's a fair amount that they never identify out of um, ones that they seriously study. You know, right now they that show Project Blue Book is out, and everybody's talking about it. That's the big thing. Um, and, of course, I think some of it is uh, a little bit Hollywooded up. But um, is there something about this this uh, J. Allen Hynek story that you feel needs to be discussed that nobody's discussing? Because I know you've got a lot of documents in your book, pictures of his work. He was pretty extensive with what he was doing. Well, I was really impressed with what he did. In my book, I was able to include some of his handwritten letters, and I felt that he's done an awful lot of writing in the technical fields and everything, but I thought these letters showed more about him than his technical writing, and I almost kind of felt like I knew him. In fact, one of the couple of them were me, but um, he impressed me quite a bit, and he was very intelligent. Um, so far as in scientific work, but he also had a very good personality. He was real charming, I think, from, it sounded like from the letters, had a real good sense of humor, Mm -hmm. joked around, harassed people, and things like that, that, you know, made him very human, and just a, he seemed like a really nice person, besides being, you know, such a genius in his, um, his scientific work. I want to talk to you a second about something that's really f- kind of freaking me out. Uh, Warner Von Braun had this uh, uh, theory, and I guess it was his prophecy, some people say, that we were going to be, uh, that the government was going to set up things in space because they were they were going to project on us through the media that we were under threat by asteroids, and then after that, uh, they would do kind of like a fake alien invasion, or there would be threats of aliens. Now, based on what I'm seeing today with this Space Force stuff, uh, all of the articles coming about how asteroids are flying close to the Earth, it seems like one comes out every day now. And with the UFO thing kind of getting a little bit more out in the public, doesn't it seem like there's something going on behind the scenes with this whole Space Force thing, and that Warner Von Braun might be a little correct about all that. It's kind of mishmashed a little bit, though. It makes me nervous because they're talking about Star Wars type thing. I think they brought it up uh, when Reagan was president and people decided against it for good reason. But they're starting it again, and it's pretty scary because if they put weapons in space... What happens next? I mean, it, um, you don't have to worry about UFOs. You might have to worry more about what people are going to do to each other. Right, yeah, the the mass hysteria of the media and everything. It's It does, it seems, I mean, even when a, an asteroid is 300 million miles away, which is pretty close compared to a lot of asteroids, they'll put out an article that says, you know, this thing is closest to Earth more than it's ever been. And then there's another one and another one. And I'm thinking, what's the deal with trying to scare us about all this stuff? And when they talk about uh, UFOs now, or these UFOs since uh, December of 2017, they talk about it as if it's a threat, right? And in your, one of your chapters, you talk about, you know, no threat. They could destroy life on our planet. Did they act that way when you worked in the government as if anything odd was a threat if they did talk about it? I think in, uh, I I was actually very lucky to be in a section where they were kind of serious about UFOs, but I think in general, it just laughed at and, you know, viewed as a fairy tale or something. Um, but I think somewhere in the government they took it, they take it pretty seriously. But I don't know what all they know. I don't think they know a whole lot because if they did, they'd be um, making UFOs and that sort of thing. That we'd be flying around in UFOs if they really knew anything about them. Well, uh, well, I can. I was going to talk to you about the consciousness aspect of all this, but I can wait after the break here because we're about to have to take one. Do you think, has anything changed since your work with the government? Do you think anything's changing? Are we progressing in your mind? Are we getting better at um, disclosing this information? I think with 
I don't know how good it's working with the whole Bob Lazar thing. I honestly don't. I know Jeremy Corbell and Bob Lazar are going around, going on a lot of TV shows and really talking this up. And even when Larry King asked him a question, it's like, look, uh, what do you want to tell us? And he's like, well, I just want to tell you that they're working on something. That's it. And that's all we, that's all we know. That's all we know. Yep. They exist and they're working on something. I don't feel like we're getting any further in this. I just don't. And I'm wondering if you feel like we're getting any further at all in the study and disclosure of UFOs. Yeah. Uh, I don't think they're getting real far in the study because there isn't any evidence that so far as I know that they're, that the country is producing anything like UFOs. Mm-hmm. Um, or that they have control over it or anything like that. I'm sure they're studying it somewhere. Um, so it's, it's kind of like the government's just as clueless as the rest of us on this, right? But they want to keep a lid on it. I sort of have that feeling. Right. I mean, I think they understood much about it, that there'd be some evidence of unusual things that the government's flying around, and I'm not too sure if there are. There probably are some, but I don't know. So in your in your book, uh, did you come up with any documents that nobody else has, or any evidence that nobody else has at all in this new book? Well, I had actual. Um, well, I had the correspondence of G. Allen Hynek, and that showed you know that he was really interested and really serious about it, and described some of the um, things he investigated. But I also. Um, Project Blue Book took place at Mattel Memorial Institute and at Wright Patterson, and I'd been at both places and talked to people that were involved in Project Blue Book and involved in the studies. And I had documents from Mattel Memorial Institute um, that uh, had been used to study the actual study that was done, and I, also the results that they found um, Project Blue Book, such as the TV show, it looks like it's just an Indiana Jones type thing where they go out and explore and study the UFO sightings. And there's a hidden part of it, though, and that is that Project Blue Book um, did a real good study of the reports that uh, people made and at Battelle Memorial Institute, they did a real good study of analyzing these reports and doing statistical study on them. And that turned out with amazingly positive results. It's probably the only study that was actually done that wasn't sort of a fake study. And it showed very strongly that UFOs, um, statistically and scientifically, that UFOs likely exist, and they had real high statistical probabilities, such as more than one chance out of a billion, that they're not just, um, you know, something misidentified or that sort of thing. Did he really, like it shows in the movie, in the, in the show, did he really, based on your research, did he really keep his family out of the loop like that? Just keep him in the dark? I don't know. Um, I wonder there's... about that because I would <laughs> I would tell I mean if because you know like his wife's probably bugging him when you do secret things around women especially your wife or girlfriend they they want to know you know and uh, in the in the show it's he's like nah he just doesn't say anything he doesn't do anything it doesn't really let him know what's going on but of course there's only been a few episodes of it um, but uh, like you say in your book he might be called Mister Blue Book but. Uh, he was not part of the main, you say he wasn't part of the main Blue Book UFO study. That's interesting because I've thought that he was. Well, they were doing a secret study at Battelle, and it was top secret, and it um, was a study of the results of the investigations. And for a while, um, just the people that worked on it knew about it, and it wasn't him, and there were several places where somebody said Dr. Heineck didn't know about this. Huh. Uh, just there were people with high clearances that did the study. 
so you're saying okay so let me just before we take a break here real quick so you're saying that they had a they had the project blue book they had their own they did their own research they did their own protocols so to speak and really all he was for was a certain part of that to where he would just look at the i guess the science of it and that was it they didn't really let him in on everything that they're showing us maybe in the show yeah the meat of the study was actually the statistical report and that was done in secret and the only way anybody found out about it was due to leakers and it's still not very little known to the public that that was um done that they had analyzed the data um I don't know anything about his family, how, whether he told him or not. I never heard that he didn't tell him, but I don't right. know a thing about that. Well, yeah, that's just me assuming, though, too. I'm sure I was thinking maybe you, you got a letter or something, because you got some, uh, I guess you could say, manuscripts or a lot of stuff here that I've never seen before. But we do got to take a break, guys. We'll be right back uh, with Dr. Irina Scott. We're going to be talking about the cover-ups, Project Blue Book, and her new book, And you guys, uh, make sure you go check it out. You can get it on Amazon. It's available right now. If you want to go check out the book, it's called Sacred Corridors. And we'll be right back. Stick around. Do you ever wonder why there's so much show in politics? Do you ever wonder why America's not getting fixed? Ever wonder why our media is not reporting the news? They report only their biased opinion. Are you tired of feeling like a controlled rat? Do you wonder what's next? If you're looking for answers, join me, Ronnie McMullen, for my new show, Deep Waters Radio. That's Deep Waters Radio. Monday nights, 9 p.m. Pacific, right here on the Fringe FM. When you're always on the go, it can be a hassle getting the proper servings of veggies and fruits into your everyday diet. Life gets hectic, making it hard for us to always make healthy food choices. Not to mention it's pretty expensive. Wouldn't it be great to ditch the long grocery store lines, but still get your fruits and veggies all at once? What you need is Balance of Nature Fruits and Veggies Capsules, made with 31 of the highest quality fruits and vegetables and grown right here in the USA. Balance of Nature is 100% natural, safe, and affordable. For a limited time, use discount code TALK and you'll get 35% off your first preferred set of Balance of Nature fruit and veggie capsules, along with free shipping. Call 1-800-246-8751 today. Ready for the real results you want and need? Then you need Balance of Nature. Call 1-800-246-8751. That's 1-800-246-8751 and use code TALK. Hi, this is Aaron Hunter, host of Real Paranormal Activity, the podcast where we tell real paranormal experiences of people from around the world. And we also conduct interviews with authors, investigators, psychics, and mediums. Real people, real stories, real fear. Thursdays at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern on The Fringe FM. See you then. When I'm done running with the wolves after hunting down a half-ton bison, I look forward to a mind-teetering escapade evening on The Fringe FM. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. This is Cortana from Shift Happens, telling you to pour a glass and park your ass because you're listening to KTLK, the Fringe FM. Shifthead. Folks, this is very important information. What's to be said about CBD? AncientLifeOil.com. Our CBD is made from hemp and has .003 THC, which means this wonderful product won't get you high. No matter what amount you take, what does CBD do for the body? My hands are tied. But you can Google CBD benefits and be astounded. When you're finished reading, you'll want to log on to ancientlifeoil.com. That's ancientlifeoil.com. 
and purchase. Life is good when you feel good. People are tired of pain. People are asking for non-GMO organic products to help them with <laughs> you fill in the blank. Legal in 49 states, and again, our CBD is made from hemp. Ancient Life Oil is about helping people one by one by one. If you wonder how good the product is, the CEO takes it every day without miss. AncientLifeOil.com. That's AncientLifeOil.com. Have a great day. Howdy, this is Catalina, and you're listening to Lighting the Void with Joe Roop. Welcome back to Lighting the Void. Thank you so much for joining us. Don't forget, after the show, you can listen to The Secret Teachings directly after Lighting the Void every weeknight here on The Fringe FM. Also, next week, we did reschedule Jason Augustus Newcomb. He'll be back with us Tuesday, and we're going to talk about his book, The New Hermetics. But we are here tonight with Dr. Irina Scott, and we are discussing uh, Disclosure, her new book, Sacred Corridors, and some government cover-ups. And uh, Dr. Scott, I was wondering, in your time with the DIA, what what convinced you that there was something, what was the one thing that, or just one big thing that convinced you that something else was going on or that maybe they had a different section of government that they were keeping from us? Well, what happened was is that um, I'm not only an investigator, I'm also an experiencer. And while I was working for the DIA with the high security clearance, I was in air order of battle, and we were using satellite photography to study anything that was flying over this particular area of the Earth and identify it. Well, my sister and I had gone out um, on going on a trip and had a weird UFO experience, you know, which seems kind of weird when you're working at a job like that, and you you can't go around at work, especially that kind of work, and say, well, I see UFOs. But anyway, right, I right. mentioned, <laughs> I'd be in deep trouble. But I mentioned um, the sub- just the subject of UFOs, not saying that I saw any um, at work. And I expected everybody to laugh at me because they were kind of hardcore, you know, government people. It was the DIA was composed of military and civilian both and from all the areas of the military. And um, the section I was working in was called Air Order of Battle, where we worked on this particular section of Earth and tried to identify everything in the air over it. There, um, my boss, I think, was a GS-14, maybe, which is pretty high. And also there was an Air Force major in this section, and then another civilian and I. And um, so I mentioned that at work and expected the hardcore people to laugh me out of the office. But um, they said that um, they had actually turned in a report from our satellite photography of a UFO. Um, And that the government told them, you know, the higher ups were went on up through the whatever ranks that um, that they didn't see anything that that wasn't on the photography, mm. and it really definitely was because I saw the photography, and it was on two different missions. And when a uh, mission like is like ninety minutes when the satellite goes around the Earth, and it was in a slightly different position. But you could see it, and I even managed to get it in stereo. And it definitely, what the um, higher ups, it probably went from the DIA to the CIA. I'm not real sure. But what they said was is that it was a flaw in the film. And it wasn't a flaw in the film. The My supervisors even sent it to uh, photographic experts, and they said this wasn't a flaw in the film. And it obviously wasn't because it was on two different missions. But the um, higher-up said, yes, it was a flaw in the film. And we were supposed to be the experts. I mean, my section was the experts for the government. 
Yeah, so you're telling them, no, it's not. You hired me for this. I'm telling you that this is something, you know, in the field of where I'm looking, and they're telling you, no, it's not. And they probably don't know about it as much as you do. That's right. And professionally, if we were, if the section was making a mistake, well, they should have politely told us, you're doing this wrong, and this is why. But instead, they just insisted it was a flaw in the film, which it obviously wasn't. And it was kind of interesting because maybe that's how they um, study UFOs in the government now, maybe through satellite photography might be one method. But and it was it would be sort of involved in security because it, we were supposed to be identifying what's in the air and, you know, you could start World War Three or something by misidentifying something. So you'd think they ought to tell us about UFOs anyway, but they didn't, and they insisted what we saw was a flaw in the film. And so I thought way up there, somewhere where there's high clearances, that somebody knows what they're doing and is disguising things even from other people in the government that should be knowing, that should know something about it. Now, back then, that was what? Was that in the 60s or 70s when that happened? It was uh, 1968. 1968. Okay, so this is it's it's been some years since this happened. Which, if you think about that, there's no telling what they got now. But that to me is definitely a sign that something was going on back then. Uh, did you say? Do you remember if you once they gave you that pushback on that? Did you fight it at all for, or just say, well, you know, I imagine at some point it became not much of a fight. You just had to kind of go on with what you were doing. Yeah, I think my supervisors disagreed with them and let them know in several ways that they were wrong. But finally it just passed over and nobody talked about it anymore because um, there were just two sides. And (laughs) obviously they were the higher side, but we were the right side. I think when we talk about – when we talk about – aliens and ets and crafts from other places we automatically uh, if we use logic we automatically say okay well there's many planets and star systems and stuff out there the probability that there's uh, other life out there is of course it's very probable the probability that somebody has better technology than us is very probable Uh, it it really amazes me how they and all of these projects from project sign all the way up to today how they treat people as if we're ignorant sometimes like not just ignorant but hey this isn't this is how it is move on with your life that's why i think uh when they did this thing with to the stars and this whole gimbal footage that by now the pressure got so much from the community and certain investigators and political movers like stephen bassett and so forth that they had to at least give us something and I was never, you know, I, I know I'm bringing this up again, but I was never happy with that. I was never glad that that was what they were going to give us. And then they wanted to create this big media thing around it, which, by the way, is failing. Uh, and I just hope that it's not going to be another 40 to 50 years before they give us anything else. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. You ta- imp- no, go ahead. Oh. Sorry. Well, my impression is, is that... Um, they always talk about the disclosure and it's like it just comes from the government. Like the only component of disclosure is from the government, Mm -hmm. but there's two parties. There's the government and there's the UFOs and you can't disclose something without both parties. And like if the government discloses and say, well, we know all this, but basically unless the UFOs are cooperating, there wouldn't be any way for the government to prove anything if they did know about it. I mean, you'd have to have, you know, some form of control or something with the UFOs to demonstrate that you're really disclosing something. So it seems like it'd be very difficult, actually, even if they have, they, I'm sure they have more information than the civilians, but I don't know how they can really disclose unless they really know how, 
have some way to control the UFOs to show that they're that they're um, that they really exist. Yeah, they don't. There's probably all kinds of things they don't want to talk to us about that they're not in control of or don't know about, other than just UFOs. Uh, did you did you ever run into the CIA while you were working doing this work? I think our reports went to the CIA, and they may have been the people that told us we weren't seeing anything. Yeah. That there wasn't anything there. I can imagine that. And this is the first time that I've talked to you on Lighting the Void. Earlier you said that you're also an experiencer. Can you tell me about that a little bit? Yeah. Um, that's why I'm into UFOs is to do <laughs> my own observations. Mm-hmm. And, um it began when I was very young. Um, I'm from the Midwest, and we're from uh, the Midwest is kind of back in those days, especially. They don't talk about weird things, and so you we weren't supposed to talk about UFOs. And my sister and I, when we were really young kids, I think she was about four and I was about six, were living out in the country in a farmhouse, and we'd never heard of UFOs or anything else. And one clear summer night, we were sleeping in a um, kind of an attic room. She was on one side and I was on the other. And I woke up, and this thing was flying around the room. It looked like a little piece of hot metal, and it was just flying around. And even at that age, we both knew something was wrong because something was unusual because it was guided. It would there were furniture and beds and walls and different things and it never bumped into anything it just flew and it got pretty close to both of us neither one of i didn't know she was awake and she didn't know i was awake so we were both just independently watching it and it flew (laughs) around it it would go up and down and across and just a browsing motion like it was looking around if you want you know some a subjective opinion but um what year what year was this you don't mind me asking it was way way back (laughs) way way back okay (laughs) way way back um and um because we never even heard of ufos at the time it was how far back it was of course we were in an isolated um farmhouse with just one radio and things too but um it wasn't too long after ufos came out and it was just flying around and finally it flew up to the ceiling um, and then it didn't hit the ceiling it made a right hand turn and flew over and this was an attic room and the um, walls sloped up to the ceiling there was about three feet between the two walls where they uh, came into the ceiling and we there was a chandelier in the middle of the room and the object flew over to the chandelier and began circling but didn't feel its way around or anything it just very smoothly went to a certain distance away from the chandelier and began to circle and you know it was right between the chandelier and the walls so it was like it knew where it was going and it circled the chandelier for quite a while like 30 times or something and it seemed to speed up a little bit and then it made a spiral down and then I became just so terrified, didn't know what to do, and began shrieking. At the same time, my sister began shrieking, and we ran out of the room and fell down the stairs and ran shrieking to our parents, and they didn't believe us. And my father threatened to beat us up if we didn't go back upstairs, and we just stood there waiting to get beaten. And so he went up and looked and said everything was safe, and so we went back. But... um, there were some elements to that that <laughs> were kind of scary because we didn't know how the thing got in the room. The doors were locked. It was a country place, and there were, um, there wasn't a light coming in the window or anything. The window was had a screen, and the doors were locked, so we had no idea how it got in there. There wasn't a thunderstorm or anything. It was a perfectly clear night, and then we didn't know why we both woke up at the same time. And without communicating with each other, we also didn't know why we suddenly became terrified at the same time. And um, 
it was years and years and years before I associated that with UFOs. But um, it was like we owned some kind of mind control way back then when we were kids. It was a pretty scary thing to think about. Boy, that is a freaky story. That's freaky. Then, I know. <laughs> well, I've only so this thing was small then. It wasn't like a giant aircraft. It was small. It flew in to where you guys were were at, right? It was probably uh was it was it like one of those mini UFOs a lot of people talk about? I don't know. It was just like a little piece of metal. Uh it was glowing and it, just real hot metal. Huh. Um and when it happened, we had no idea what it was and we discussed it with our parents the next day, and then l- several years later, we heard about UFOs, but we didn't connect that with the idea of UFOs because we thought of UFOs at that time as, you know, aircraft or spaceships or something like that. But many, many years later, I read a book by Jenny Randalls, a British ufologist, who described bedroom visitations in children. And she described kind of like what we saw, that often there's sort of a pattern that children will see small UFOs, like in their bedroom or in some room, and then later they grow up and they see, have other experiences with UFOs. And um, so that seemed to be, that tied that to our idea of UFOs. It was many years later, though. And we sort of fit that into that pattern, but we don't know why we had a number of other sightings. Yeah, that's a whole nother topic about UFOs that I wonder about sometimes is the metals or the precious metals or the metals that come from other places, so to speak. And in your book, you do mention about how, you know, it's kind of strange that certain scientists who appeared to be metallurgists rather than you know, statisticians, I guess, if that's the right word for it, or others involved with just information processing were selected for uh, statistical work that led to the SR-14 deal, right? So it's like, why did they have metallurgists doing that stuff? That doesn't make sense. Yeah, that was the advantage of working at Mattel, was is that you heard a lot of stories about that. And in this case... Um, they were studying the results of Project Blue Book, which, you know, in the TV it shows Dr. Heineck and everybody going out investigating. Well, um, what they did with that information was they devised, they had um, psychologists devise um, a questionnaire where they could get real discreet um, information from observations. I mean, like it would ask, what color is this object? I got you. How many you see or how long a duration so that they could get real discrete things to study statistically. And then the rest of it was a statistical study of that information. So what they needed to study it was statisticians and uh, psychologists. But what they actually hired in the study were metallurgists. And that seemed... Sneaky, sneaky, right? Doesn't it seem like they're being sneaky? You think about this. If you're an intelligence agent, you would say, okay, we've got some inkling that there's some weird metal out there, and we're going to do this project, and we're going to have these guys do statistics. But make sure, I mean, if think about it. If you're in the CIA, make sure that these guys have some type of major in metallurgy or something, so that if they do run across it, they'll report it. Well, everybody that I knew can <laughs> involved in this study was a metallurgist. They didn't really? have, yeah, in the SR-14 study, the special report number 14 study where they analyzed the data. Um, they had um, psychologists to uh, devise the um, questionnaire, and it was done by statisticians, but they main people we knew were metallurgists that um, look, that apparently did the analysis. That's kind of weird. And I've never seen anything like that. I've never seen us. I've seen orbs and maybe they're the same thing. I don't know, but I've never seen anything like hot metal flying through the air. I know Whitley did, uh, 
described small UFOs. I had another friend that did too. Now, is that the only experience you had when you were a child? And that was it. I mean, that's enough. That'd be enough for me. But is that the only one that you had? No, we had uh, other ones when we were younger and then some <laughs> scary ones when we were older too. Um, another one I had when I was young, maybe 11 or something, was as I was sleeping outside on a, we had a rock porch. It was summer and I, it was hot. And I woke up and looked north and this big globe was flying um uh, toward me and then when it got right overhead all the dogs in the neighborhood suddenly began to bark and we had a dog in our house and it sounded like it was tearing up the the kitchen or something even though it couldn't see it Mm -hmm. and um that was another one i didn't say anything about it to anybody though for years and years and years and then my sister and i had a really weird one while i was working for the dia and that's why i mentioned the subject of the dia and found out about the sighting. Would you be interested in hearing our um, our sighting then? Oh yeah, definitely would. I I just uh, I think the little so a lot of this stuff we're going to figure out in the details, like some of the stuff that you put in your book about that. Why it's not it's not something that we really think about, but most of the people you were working with were hired for statistics, but they all had you know, they were all very, I guess, advanced or skilled in, in the study of metal. That's probably one of the strangest things I've ever heard about all this. Doesn't make well, sense. I mean, it does, but it, it doesn't add up. Yeah. Uh, they always said for a long time that there was nothing to this. Um, and there was nothing to the wondering why they had metal or just, but um, in working there, Another person and I talked to a person that um, said that he had studied, he was a metallurgist and said that he had studied a piece of metal that was uh, from ET that was um, from UFOs. And we reported on that in our book and we reported earlier, he reported about 1952 and he didn't, he just told, you know, a friend. He didn't make a big deal out of it because he'd probably get in trouble if he did. But he was a uh, fairly high rank of manager and he was working in metallurgy. And um, so we reported that in about, I think, um, the 1990s uh, somewhere. And, um, but when he talked about it, the, uh, study at Battelle was top secret, so he probably was in on things because otherwise he wouldn't have known anything about it. And then later, um, Don Smith and uh, Carey in Witness to Roswell wrote about it, wrote about our report, and then they, um, they speculated it was memory metal from Roswell, and it made quite a splash on... Um, the internet, there were vast numbers of articles about memory metal and that maybe Battelle had been actually studying metal from Roswell. And think about that, like what year that was in. we got to take a break. But if that was back then, then what in the hell are they doing now? You know, if they if they really knew about that metal and they were that's what they were really doing. Um, yeah, it's fascinating stuff. We got to take a break. We're here with, uh, oh, sorry about that. Somebody sent in a question and I didn't get to, uh, I did not get to to ask it. I told him I would. We'll do it after the break. I promise. I promise. Uh, but, uh, we're here with Dr. Scott. We're talking about our new book, Sacred Corridor, Secrets Behind the Real Project, Blue Book, Wright Patterson Air Force Base, Battelle, Memory Metal, which is something that I'm just now learning about, actually, and Dr. J. Allen Hynek and UFO cover-ups. You guys stick around. We'll be right back with more Lighting the Void coming up.
Okay, nurse, let's get this man to the ER stat. Right away, doctor. We see this every day. Heart attack or angina pain due to blocked and clogged arteries. Chelation can remove obstructions or blockages from arteries and help avoid painful and expensive surgery. Now there's Angioprim. It's a liquid oral chelation product that you take with juice. You start to feel the results fast. Angioprim increases blood flow all over the body, and that means more energy and strength to take on the day with less aches and pains. 60 years of research has gone into chelation. And angioprim is the result, a safe and easy way to unblock your veins and arteries from buildup that slow circulation. Paging Dr. Jones, please report to the emergency room right away. Log on now for a special radio offer from angioprim. That's angioprim.com slash radio, A-N-G-I-O-P-R-I-M, angioprim.com slash radio, or call 877-882-7221. That's 877-882-7221. Magic, the occult. History, health, news. These are just a few subjects discussed on my radio broadcast, The Secret Teachings. I offer unique and objective perspectives on new and old subjects alike while welcoming guests and presenting my own research with no filter. Visit my website for more information and to subscribe to my archive at www.thesecretteachings.info and find me on The Fringe FM live Monday through Friday, midnight Pacific, 3 a.m. Eastern on The Fringe FM. Introducing Shadow Light Tarot from Waking Canvas. The Fringe FM's new contributing artist, Eric Tisi. This hand-illustrated black-and-white self-published deck serves as a reinvention of the tarot never before witnessed. Each of the several suits of this 88-card deck lineup form an infinite panoramic scene. Even the included visual companion guidebook is entirely hand-illustrated, cover-to-cover with beautiful visuals and esoteric symbols and artwork. The newly released deck comes in a custom magnetic box with its own travel pouch. The Shadow Light Tarot Premium Deck and its travel size mini deck, Wonder Light Tarot, are both available now from wakingcanvas.com. If you use the code word FRINGE, that's F-R-I-N-G-E at checkout, you'll receive an extra 10% off your entire order. To discover more, including a free reading and time lapses of all the illustrated artwork, make your way over to wakingcanvas.com today. That's wakingcanvas.com. Hi. This is Sammy. Join us in the Deep South as we're lighting the void with Joe Roop on the Fringe FM. Do you want to lose weight but have no idea where to begin? The Fast Start Diet, a three-day weight loss plan, is the answer. Three days of nutritionally balanced, calorie-restricted meals delivered right to your door. No shopping, no measuring, and no cooking. Everything is prepared for you and ready to eat at home or on the go. The Fast Start Diet has all the amazing benefits of intermittent fasting without starving. We've helped thousands of people who have struggled to reach their weight loss goals. Isn't it time we helped you? With the Fast Start Diet, you'll lose weight and feel great. Find us on Amazon or go to faststartdiet.com and use promo code POWERSAVE to get 10% off your first box. And as a special bonus, we will include our number one rated appetite suppressant spray free with your order. Whatever your diet plans are, start with us at faststartdiet.com and use promo code POWERSAVE. Welcome back to Lighting the Void. Thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it, guys. Wherever you're listening from across the World Wide Web, we are talking about government cover-ups, Project Blue Book, and more with Dr. Irina Scott and her new book, Sacred Corridors. It's been an interesting conversation a little bit. I didn't think it was going to go down the uh, the mystery metal path. Uh, a question that I wanted to ask that came in right before the break, and I told the person that texted in, I was going to ask it before the break, but I didn't get to. Anyways, whatever. I know that you you uh, participated in MUFON and KUFOS, and KUFOS was, as you said, you know, Hynix organization. And um, when I first met MUFON and these, uh, I was so excited. Like I was like, man, this is a, uh, this is really cool. You know, they teach people how to investigate properly and and things of that nature. And th- it was a couple of years ago when I thought about joining MUFON and I just didn't know of any other organizations at that time, to be honest with you. And then all of this stuff came out, you know, with whatever political stuff or 
I don't even want to get into that. But the one thing that that I do worry about with organizations such as MUFON and things like that is how do we know? I mean, how do we know the government's not doesn't have their hands in this stuff too? Uh, I've got so many people that have told me that they've tried to look at certain cases or photos and pictures that MUFON had that they can't they can't get their hands on. And maybe you don't know about it. Maybe it's because maybe you're just out of the loop. But I had to ask you because I don't get many people from MUFON on the program. Well, I know that um, they had this really good organization called NICAP, and it became infiltrated by the government until it kind of fell apart. And you may not know it until later, (laughs) uh, because uh, we started out with an organization in Ohio before it became MUFON, and there was some evidence that there was a mole there that was turning things over maybe into the government. Wow. And I, it wouldn't be hard for the government to find out anything because they could find out everything about anything that's on computers because they could just break into the computers. So, and um, whether MUFON knew it or not. And so I don't think you can keep too many secrets from the government anyway. Uh, but you're talking about, is there a deliberate thing? Yeah, I'm talking about, like, how come we can't look at certain photos? Are there certain cases that that they just won't, either they won't investigate uh, or um, they have the, the information and they won't let the public look at it? Do you have a particular instance? I do have a particular instance with a friend of mine, but I'm afraid that if I t- say their name that I... I I really would have to ask him if I I can do that. I was just I don't want to say their name because they've been on the show a couple of times and I'm already given too many hints about it. But they they had some problems with MUFON and then I looked at uh, but at any organization right you have problems. I think when it, when things get so big certain things happen right. So uh, and you were involved with this stuff I think way before most of these people were even ever involved with it and that. Brings me to my next question, avoiding my first one, by the way. Uh, but um, Kufos, Hynix organization, I wonder why that never really took off or it's not as big. Do you ever wonder about that? Well, it really took off for a while while he was alive, and then it um, is withering away now. Um, they don't have meetings or have a publication or anything. And... Um, I think he was such a driving force when he was alive that it was a great organization, but it seems to have not been followed through since then. Yeah. Uh, that makes sense. Yeah. Resources help, right? Uh, before uh, we went to the break, you, you were going to mention another experience. Do you remember that by chance, Dr. Scott? Yeah, it was a very complicated um, experience. And that's what caused me to mention it to um, the DIA, which I was working for the DIA then. Uh, I was working in Washington, D.C., and my sister was at postgraduate work in Drew University in New York. And we were on that, uh, the Atlantic seacoast, so we decided to go up and see the New England states. And we drove up to Boston and... Um, it was still daylight when we got there and drove up to, through New Hampshire and later discovered that we'd been where the Bar- Betty and Barney Hill, uh, part of that took place. And anyway, we drove back to Boston and looked for mo- motels and we couldn't find any. And we were told to um, go around the Outer Belt. And so we were leaving Boston and uh, driving out west, first of all, to get to the Outer Belt. And we began to see this object to the south. It was blinking, and it was bright, very white light. Um, and there was an airport to the south, too. It was the Norwich Municipal Airport. <clears throat> and we could see airplanes coming from the east and landing. Mm-hmm. And you could see the different lights on the aircraft and things, so that you could definitely tell aircraft. 
and this object didn't look anything like an aircraft. <coughs> it was just a very bright white light. <coughs> it seemed to be following the freeway down um, from Boston. And um, we got closer, and my sister kept saying, this is something odd. Look at that. And I kept arguing with her and saying it's a helicopter blinking its landing lights because it was sort of following a sort of a random browsing motion, even though it was in general going south. And she said it would just appear one place and disappear and then appear someplace else. And I didn't see that because I was driving. But she kept yelling at me to stop and stop and look at this. And I told her that if it were a UFO, that the police and the uh, reporters and news people and everything else would be out looking at it because it was kind of obvious. So I thought it couldn't possibly be anything. And we were uh, driving down um, on the freeway 95 through a woods. And I saw this, we saw this light. Um, in a woods maybe 50 feet from the car, big, I mean, just estimating, it was round, and it went through a spectrum of lights, such as all shades of red and all shades of blue, and then all shades, um, all, um, just a spectrum of red and blue. All so it shades changed of, a lot of colors. Yeah, the different colors. And as we drove by it, the inside of the car lit up in green, Hmm. And I looked around, and I thought, where's that coming from? And I saw no green beam at all, and I looked at the light, and it wasn't green, and I had no idea why um, the car lit up in green. But we kept on driving, and we were still seeing the thing in front of us and arguing. And so my sister just started screaming at me to stop, 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 because it's going over the road. And I wasn't really watching it too much. And so I stopped the car to make her stop screaming because I didn't think it was anything. What do you mean and you weren't I, watching it too much? Were you distracted by the green light in the car or something? No, the green light had disappeared by then, and okay. we were just driving. But um, I just wasn't paying attention to it because I thought if this is something important, there'd be people watching it. Yeah, I got you. And so I didn't pay attention, but she was paying attention. And so I stopped and looked out the window, and I saw something that looked like a meter way off and then this thing came over the road and my sister and her report we made out reports uh, later that where we didn't uh, talk about it until then and she said there was a light that shone down and shone down into the car from it then but anyway this big thing came over the trees and we were stopped and it um, was very close and very slow and then had it looked like seven windows, and these were square windows. And you might say, well, this is a blimp. But we grew up on a farm with a, uh interstate freeway that went through the farm. It was a blimp route that followed the freeway back then. And we were very used to seeing blimps along freeways and blimps with lighted sides and all kinds of things. So we were very familiar with blimps. And anyway, the thing came was going over the road very slowly. And we could see the the um, the lights on the side had a blinking pattern, and we were discussing that with each other. And I had a camera in the car and high speed film in the trunk. And if I'd have even thought for a second that this is maybe a UFO, I'd have had my camera ready and loaded. But at that time, I very quickly got my camera out and found the film, and it was a Polaroid with high speed three hundred. AS 3000 ASA film, which I could take pictures with in the dark. And um, so I was loading the camera. And this thing you could see inside the windows. And I thought this is going to be an amazing picture because I'll get a picture of the inside of a UFO. We couldn't see pilots or anything. It was just like the whole all the walls were white or the whole inside was glowing. It was this real white light. And a truck driver um, parked in front of us. It pulled over and parked and walked toward us. And so I didn't take pictures right then because I was a little bit scared of a man, but I thought, oh, this is great. We'll have another witness. And he came up and stood beside me and asked, what are you doing? And 
we didn't say UFOs around a strange man or anything like that, but we pointed <laughs> at it and asked, you know, like it was an airplane, and asked, what is that? And he just rotated around, looked in the exact opposite direction, about the same altitude, and said, I don't see anything. And then he rotated back and looked at me. And he was standing right beside me, and I was a little bit nervous, and I was a lot more nervous after that. So he asked me the same question again. And we pointed at it again. And he turned around in the opposite direction, looked, and said, I don't see anything. And then he turned around and, you know, rotated around and looked at me again. And then he pointed to his head, and he went back to the truck. And at, even when I wrote my book, I was thinking this might be a coincidence. But after that, I realized it wasn't. I mean, just recently I realized it. Because when somebody points at somebody at something, and you can't see it, you look in that direction. You don't look in the exact opposite direction and say, I don't see it. So there was something deliberate about that. And then... Um, Do you remember what he was driving? Yeah, he had a truck, and it was like a large U-Haul. Uh, but we didn't pay too, too much attention to it because uh -huh. I was trying to get a picture. And I was afraid. I had this high-speed film in, and I was afraid I might get lens flares, lens flares from the freeway. And there was a hill nearby, and so I ran up the hill. And my sister said when I ran up the hill, the object had been right over me. But I don't... I wasn't paying attention. I think I was just running up the hill, and there were trees over me. And anyway, I got to the hill, and I very carefully took five pictures, very carefully making sure there's nothing in the picture except that light. And by that time, it was so far away, you couldn't see the windows. You could just see one uh, real white blinking light. And I got, uh, with the Polaroids, kind of complicated. You have to pull them out and coat them and things, and so... I pulled them out and ran down the hill and looked at them and then coated them and one picture turned out but it was handheld pictures and I didn't I just I took a time exposure but I just guessed on how long to take it so it was um, a little hard to take in the you know night when you're hand holding the camera and everything and so anyway the object went over to the airport and it began to circle the airport and we both remember very clearly of seeing the airplanes flying above. Nobody was landing then. And this thing circling the airport. And it went through this particular lighting pattern when it circled, too. And so I didn't know where it was going to go. But we wanted to see if we could find out some more about it, even though we'd seen that crazy man. And so I decided to uh, pull on the freeway and go to the next intersection and turn the car around in case it went in the other direction. And so I got on the freeway and this man pulled out. He was in his truck watching us while we were there. Um, so he wasn't just checking on our condition or anything like a truck driver would. And he got right on my bumper and turned his bright lights on so that it was shining right in my mirror. And I was just blinded. And uh, he was definitely chasing us because I'd switch lanes and speed up and slow down and things, and he'd this just was, stay right on my bumper. This was a different man? No, this was the same man. The same guy? Yeah. That's so weird. I know. And it was not only weird, but I was pretty sure I was going to get killed because after a while I was just had the car floored thinking I could get away from him because the car is, you know, lighter. But he just, and he was a heavy truck, but he just kept right on my bumper, and finally I decided that what I'd try to do to get away from him was to go from, was to suddenly pull off at a high speed from the left-hand side at, off at an intersection, and this was a real dangerous thing to do because if somebody was coming even faster on the right-hand side, we'd have been dead, but I did it and got rid of him, so we drove back up to where the thing was still circling, and then it took off to the north. Um, it had been going south. It then took off to the northwest. And so we followed it back up. And we came to that thing where the light was. And the inside of the car lit up in green again. And then we followed it. But the uh, roads went east and west and north and south. And this just kept going northeast. And so we had to zigzag. And finally we were on this real deserted road with potholes and um 
houses a long ways away from each other, no place to turn around. It was just going a little bit faster than we were. And uh, if I went faster, I would have torn up the car. And so I turned around, and we still couldn't find any hotels. And I went back to uh, Drew, and we slept there. And I waited for these people I'd picked up from the DIA, and they couldn't, we couldn't find them. And so finally I went back to Washington. And then after that, I had this weird poltergeist experience so it was a really weird experience and that's and I'd never heard of poltergeist at the time and I thought I'd just gone insane and I had to go to work um the poltergeist went right up until I had to go to work what do you want to happen um well I went to bed and I kept hearing a man walking around in my room and there was a little bit of light from a street light, but I couldn't see anybody. And sometimes I'd try to feel, and I couldn't feel anybody, but I could hear somebody walking. And then my alarm started going off. And the first time it went off, it was, I think, around 1.30. And I thought it was time to get up. Then I realized it was dark, and I was terrified because I was hearing this man. But I went to sleep, and then it went off at 2.30, and I went back to sleep 3.30, and I went back to sleep 4.30 and 5.30. And it, um, the alarm clock had uh, the stub where you turn the alarm thing broken off, so it was really hard to set. And each time I reset it, it was just approximately, but it was reset right on the hour all times. It just had the little knob sticking up where the knob went on top of it, didn't it? Yeah, and I had to use twe- tweezers because the knob was broken off. And there was no way to grasp it, and use I usually use pliers or something. And so then I was sitting on my bed thinking, I'm going to get fired if I've just gone insane. And my toothbrush flew across the room, and then I had to go to work. And I thought, I'm insane. Uh, I'm going to get in trouble, and I was trying to figure out how to not talk to anybody and kind of hide all day. And then the whole thing went away, and nothing ever happened like that again. But, you know, years later, I found out I heard about poltergeist, too. <laughs> what about your sister, though? Does she ever talk about this stuff, or did 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 she have a poltergeist experience afterwards? No, and we didn't see any, each other for a long time after that because she became a missionary in Brazil and I got married and moved to Nevada. And so it was many years later before we even talked about it. And then I didn't talk about it too much because that night I had taken real good notes on everything, whether I understood it or not. And I was afraid that if we talked about it, we'd influence each other. And finally, years later, I reported we reported it, but we still hadn't talked to each other. And so we wrote out um, the forms to report it, and it was independent because we still hadn't discussed it with each other. And so when I read her report, there were things I found out that you know I didn't know about from my report. When uh, when you were when you had the experience with the ball and the green light and everything, that place where you were at were there fields out there? Was it, or was it all woods? Right where it happened was woods. I don't know what it would be now, but now it's woods. I mean, when it was, it was woods. Um, I just heard of, the only thing, the only reason why I ask, I heard of reports like that of blinking balls of light uh, that it, there's been witnesses talking about how they create crop circles and stuff. So I was just wondering if, why in the world it would be out there. But that's, that's weird. Well, I, there's no explaining I, any of that, is there? No. Uh, and, um... Later, I was studying um, UFO sightings in that area, in the New England area. And there were other instances of, one of them was a book called The Bluff Lodge uh, something. And um, it talked about several of the people saw UFOs and they saw these lights just like we saw around them, of round lights that went through a spectrum of colors. So other people had seen something like we saw too. Hmm. So at least I felt, you know, a little bit more familiar, but I had no idea what was going on. And with crop circles, uh, uh, this was in a woods with trees, so it wouldn't have been making a crop circle. And it was right, just that's what I was thinking. If there were fields around, 
Uh, you know, the, uh, yeah, that is a strange, I've never heard anything like that before. Um, but what I will say about your book is I've read a lot of UFO books. Well, not a lot. I would say quite a few. And a lot of them are, are opinion with very little journalism where your book, especially this one is lots of journalism and evidence and photographs of things and manuscripts and notes and just tons of journalism, and you throw your opinions and certain things to think about, actually. It's not so much opinion. It's more like, hey, this should make you think about something like that, right? So it's 100% journalism. I would say it's one of the first books I ran across that's that's like this, and uh, I'm really impressed by it because you've got quite a bit of, uh, I mean, I guess you could say circumstantial evidence and real evidence of some of the things that were going on as far as letters and notes and documents and stuff. So it's it's really, really cool, this book. Well, my experience is <laughs> writing scientific papers where you have to document everything you say. And so I'm sure I'm a lot different from a regular UFO writer because I'm still writing like I'm writing a scientific paper. So I'm a little bit different. And all of your, you've probably one of the few people that's on the earth right now that have been, and I mean this in a really great way, that have has been here studying this stuff since almost the beginning of this thing all the way through. Do you ever get any pushback from the CIA or DIA or any, did they ever call you, send you letters, tell you to stop talking about this stuff? Has any of that ever happened to you? No, but I didn't get into UFOs so far as joining organizations until uh, years after I had worked for the DIA. Okay. And that's why I didn't report anything for years later. I certainly wouldn't have reported it when I was working for him, but it was quite a long time later before I said anything about it. Yeah. Yeah. I was just wondering that because I've heard of that before where some people call and hang up stuff, you know, you hear stuff, but it's interesting to me that I'm looking at this book, sacred corridors, and it's filled with, to me, I would say evidence of a lot of what you're talking about and there's no pushback. So that, you know what that tells me is that, uh, the government is probably just as clueless as we are about these things. And so therefore they don't really look at things as a threat, so to speak, unless, you know, they're doing actual research in their organizations like you did. And then they just kind of, like you said, when you have that picture, like, Hey, there's something here and they go, no, there's nothing there, but thanks for the report. Right. So it's like, they're yep. just using a bunch of people, but they're not telling you anything. Yeah, it was just like they're telling, you know, a group of morons that, you know, you didn't see anything, which is like, you know, um, Project Blue Book. Their aim was to tell people UFOs don't exist and that sort of thing. You know, part of the people didn't like Heineck, but that was often the general idea in Project Blue Book. Well, can you please... Um, Tell everybody where they can grab this book and how they can find your website and social media and uh, and, uh, and plug away by all means, please. Okay. Uh, my website is irenascott.com, and I have the books listed. Um, and all you have to do is click on the book, and it will take you right to um, amazon.com. So it's real easy to find. And I'm also on Facebook. Um and people can ask me questions on Facebook. Even if they don't belong to Facebook, they can send messages to me. Well, thank you so much for coming on Lighting the Void. I know I kept you up late, but it was worth it because we got some really cool experiences out of the deal and a very good book. I highly recommend everybody grab this. It's it's Sacred Corridors by Dr. Irena Scott. Thank you so much for coming on Lighting the Void. Again, I, I really appreciate it and appreciate your time. And tell Philip uh, Mantle, I said thank you very much as well. Okay, and thank you. I was very uh, happy to be here. <laughs> yeah, it was great. We'll have to do it again sometime. Uh-huh. Sounds good. All right, guys, go grab the book, Sacred Corridors. We'll be right back with Madman Markham. He's going to be on the show. He hasn't been here in a long time, so that's going to be real pleasant this evening. We'll also open up the phone lines if you want to talk about your experiences the book is Sacred Corridor, Secrets Behind the Real Project Blue Book, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Roswell, Battelle, 
Memory Metal, and Dr. J. Allen Hynek and UFO Cover-Ups. It's on Amazon. Go check it out. ArenaScott.com is the website. And we'll be right back, guys. FM. All right, everyone. This is Justin from the UK. Excuse the chitty chitty. If you're into the fringe and you want to hear the brass tacks, me old China plate, Joe Roop, and his guests on Light in the Void will open your mince pies. You need to shut your north and south and use your 10 speed gears and listen to them bubble. You could hear a Barry Crocker, no Brussels, but he ain't no holy fryer. Anyway, you beat a Barnaby Rudge and take a butcher's. When you're always on the go, it can be a hassle getting the proper servings of veggies and fruits into your everyday diet. Life gets hectic, making it hard for us to always make healthy food choices, not to mention it's pretty expensive. Wouldn't it be great to ditch the long grocery store lines but still get your fruits and veggies all at once? What you need is Balance of Nature Fruits and Veggies Capsules, made with 31 of the highest quality fruits and vegetables and grown right here in the USA. Balance of Nature is 100% natural, safe, and affordable. For a limited time, use discount code TALK and you'll get 35% off your first preferred set of Balance of Nature Fruit and Veggie Capsules, along with free shipping. Call 1-800-246-8751 today. Ready for the real results you want and need? Then you need balance of nature call 1-800-246-8751 that's 1-800-246-8751 and use code talk hey friends fm listeners did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or no wi-fi available you can still listen to every minute of the fringe fm by calling 701-719-3971 no smartphone app or internet needed Saves your data plan and no extra cost if you have unlimited minutes. Call 701-719-3971. That's 701-719-3971. Listen to the Fringe FM on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in paranormal talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. You're listening to Lighting the Void Radio. Follow The Fringe FM on Facebook and Twitter at The Fringe FM. Want to know what's on The Fringe FM? Check out our schedule at thefringe.fm. We're back. 
Very interesting. Jumping right back into the UFO field, Dr. Irina Scott right off the top there. And uh, I had no idea that she was going to tell or talk about those experiences she had, but those are very, very strange. And um, I think what's interesting about her is, is that, you know, she was studying this stuff back in the day, uh, the 70s. You know, that's back in the day, 60s, 70s. To me, that's back in the day anyway. It's doing scientific research. And it's been doing research and writing books and has many books out. And some are really good if you're into a scientific approach and a journalistic approach to the study of ufology. She really writes good books. And to me, it's fascinating that we're, we just, we're not anywhere closer. I'd like to, I think a lot of people think we are closer because of all the media hype and the Bob Lazar stuff and the to the stars Academy. But the mystery is still just that it's still, a very, very big mystery, and every time I hear another story, it seems to get a little weirder. But it is cool to watch people's uh, conclusions to what that was. A very cool surprise with us here. Eric Markham has decided to join us, and we'll do open lines for the rest of the night. If you've had any UFO experiences here recently or any type of experiences, you can call the call-in line, which is one eight hundred five eight eight zero three three five. That number is toll-free from the United States or Canada. Remember, it's free. You can also text in at 501-777-5631. Thanks for coming on the program, Eric. How are you, brother? Hey, thanks for having me on, Joe. Good to be here. I know you've been going through some rough stuff with, you know, um, the passing of your mom and, and uh, you know, having to take care of all that. And it's it's been a few. I figured let's, let's have Eric on and talk to him, maybe get his mind off of some of this stuff, maybe. Because I know... It's probably, uh, it's good to have your friends around when that stuff's going on, you know? Yeah, it is. So, what did you think about her story with the green light? The red and blue flashing ball that put a green light in her car. What in the hell could that have been? Just speculating here. Well, it's, okay, it could have been a helicopter, could have been something but I think it was a UFO. You've got that that green light. It's been mentioned in other UFO uh-huh. eyewitness accounts. So yeah, I'm I'm in the. Uh, it was a UFO. <laughs> you know that that band Typo Negative. Have you heard of that band, Markham? They, they yes, played, I have. Yeah, the the lead singer sounds like uh, Dracula. I played their music before, but they got this type of a cultish feel. Well, he he wrote a uh, a song called "Creepy Green Light," and talks about that. And he doesn't talk about it being a UFO, but he talks about it as if it's just, just weird, creepy green light when crazy stuff happens, and it tends to happen a lot. I think uh, there's there's definitely something to that. I don't know about the colors and stuff uh, as far as red and flash and blue goes, because to me that sounds like uh yeah it sounds like any other aircraft, right? You would think that, anyways. Well, yeah, because most commercial aircraft and military aircraft, they've got a red light, a green light, and a white light, or they have a a strobe, depending on what kind of aircraft it does. It might have like a red strobe light on the bottom or, you know, some kind of clearance light. But that, there's been a lot of cases where people have had UFO encounters in their cars and they talk about this sort of actinic green light that, you know, permeated the inside of the car. Or in some cases, I think there was a group down in Texas, a boy, his mom, and an aunt or the grandmother. You now a family that the green light actually caused radiation burns on them. Hmm. Now, I might be remembering the color of the light wrong. You read enough of this stuff, eventually it all sort of flows together. I got to give a quick shout out here. We've got an email and it says, hey, Joe, uh, first off, I'd like to say this is from Paul. I don't, I'm not going to say your last name, but uh, first off, I love the show. I randomly came across it on the Apple podcast app. So they were listening to the free archives, I guess, a couple of months ago and have been hooked ever since. 
I actually booked an astrology reading from Mary because I know how knowledgeable she is on the cosmic conditions show you guys do. She definitely said it best that you have a genuine tenderness about you. Your show is really helping people and it's going to catch on like wildfire as people continue to wake up. Keep it up, brother. All the best, Paul. Thanks, Paul. I really appreciate that. And if any of you guys haven't gotten a lot of hate mail lately, I hadn't had hate mail in over in a couple of months. That's a good sign. You can write to one if you want. No, <laughs> yeah, write me a hate letter, will you? <laughs> yeah, I just don't want you to feel like you're, you know, get a big head and feel like you're doing everything right. No, I'm glad to hear that. I like it when the fans, like, you know, when we get somebody that takes the time to write in and tell us what they like about the show. Well, the, when I look, so before we do these shows, I always go on the news. And today, i am be honest with you guys, I spent a lot of time today trying to find something to talk about that was original. And thank God Dr. Scott came on here and told us about her stories and her investigations because everywhere, when I look into the UFO thing, it's always fast radio burst. I, there's This fast radio burst article keeps coming back around because they keep getting more of them. Amuamua or asteroids and that's it so you know after a while you get tired of talking about it i mean seriously mysterious radio signals from deep space detected astronomers have revealed details of mysterious signals emanating from a distant galaxy and these writers just keep talking about the same stuff over and over again fast radio bursts Amuamua, and it's like are we running out of stuff to talk about no We can talk about the wall all day long, but I don't want to get into that. Let's the government shut down and all this. Who in the hell cares, man? Besides the people that aren't getting paid right now because the government shut down. But as far as UFO field goes, it's just much the same crap, man. You seen anything different going on out there, Markham? Because I'm not. Not really. I think we've got our first, uh, North Carolina got its first crop circle, supposedly. I haven't had a chance to look into it too much. I just heard about it earlier, well, yesterday now. Uh, I've got some contact information. I'm going to try and get a hold of somebody that wrote the article. But other than that, you know, it's all supposition. It's There's this handful of crumbs that gets thrown out, and then everybody in the, the community writes as much as they can, infers as much as they can, and they just keep repeating the same story over and over and over again since, you know, since Roswell. There's really no new, nothing new under the sun as far as UFO goes. I'd like to see something, you know, I would like to see something come out that just, you know, real signal from, from space, not some, thing that they're going to hype for a month and then oh it's a pulsar that we've never it's a new type of pulsar we've never seen before some kind of quasar you know they're going to after it runs the gamut through all the ufo blogs and all the shows it's going to turn out they're going to call it some you know they're going to come up with a mundane excuse for what it is whether it really is a signal from another civilization or not, we'll probably never know. Well, I, I think there's something to the fast radio burst thing. They don't know what it is, and uh, and they keep writing articles about it because they keep getting these bursts. Uh, but until they know what it is, I think it's kind of dumb to just keep putting articles about aliens. It's clickbait. You guys know it's clickbait. Stop sharing it on social media. The, unless right. it's funny. If you got something funny, I'll watch it. Right, like this guy today put out a thing about the wall. He was like, "So let me get this right. Um, the uh, the government are shut down because we couldn't get Mexico to build the wall." And then, and then he just played a bunch of clips of Trump talking about how he was going to get Mexico to build a wall. See, that's funny to me because you got a point. But speculating that uh, Amuamua is a spaceship every three or four months isn't really getting us anywhere unless you guys are finding something new about it, which they're not. The only thing in space they found new here lately is that possibly uh, that there's bacteria floating above Earth that's mutating to survive, which that doesn't surprise me. We could be living inside of an alien right now and not even know it, you know. But what is on the rise as of late 
is exorcism. Exorcisms (laughs) are on the rise of late. In uh, 2019, as of the past few decades, it's pretty certain uh, that the Catholic clergy have been witnessing a very large demand for exorcisms. And this is something I brought up recently, but I didn't really get into it because I thought it was maybe a spoof article. But there's been a lot of people undergoing deliverance from demonic forces, and it seems like every single week this is happening now. Also, not just in uh, Europe and Italy or wherever, but also in the United States and in Britain. And Pope Francis, this guy talks about the devil quite a bit, has told priests that they should not hesitate to call an exorcist if they hear confessions or see behavior indicating satanic activity. Uh, And then here it says, just a few months into his pioneering pontificate Francis himself, the Pope himself performed an informal exorcism on a man in a wheelchair in St. Peter's Square, and the guy had been brought by a Mexican priest who was presented him as demon-possessed. The Pope intently laid two hands upon the man's head, uh, concentrating to drive out the demons. I wonder what... what um, I wonder what credentials you have to have to be possessed by a demon enough to get to where a priest will come out and do something. Yeah, you got to wonder. There never seems to. You would think the demons would be in, you know, high ranking politicians, high ranking military people, not just some dude. We got to get a priest on the show. We have yet to get a Catholic priest on the show and talk to him about this stuff. Oh, I can probably I can probably arrange that. Can uh, you for real? Uh, you've your family's got yeah, a good I priest, can. right? He's a cool dude too, isn't he? So yeah, our our family priest is uh, he was uh, an Air Force officer. He was married, uh, had a wife, daughter, two two sons. Uh, was a very successful lawyer. Had a you know he had a very materialistic, wealthy life. And a man who wanted to commit suicide by crashing his car chose Father Fred's family's car. It killed his wife and daughter, uh, almost killed him. And after all that, he just sort of, you know, I think the natural inclination for a lot of people would be to shake their hand to God, why have you done this to me? And he did just the opposite. And he's a very, he's a very spiritual man. And I've encountered very few priests in my life that I really thought were sincere. Some of them I've I've met, it's like, okay, they decided to be a priest so they didn't have to work for a living. But this guy uh, is not one of those. He believes what he's, you know, he believes what he's preaching. Right. He's very, you know, he is a holy man. I I don't agree with everything. You you know my views and but uh have you he seen believes that it, HBO show the Young Pope? Have you seen that? You should watch it. Uh I will. Cause I know you study the occult like I do a little bit, and if you really get into the grimoires and stuff, a lot of these guys that wrote these books were either priests Catholic priest, or even even some of them were known as saints, wrote some of these things. They were all in the clergy, isn't that something? Most of them. Well, now, when you look at the, you look at the Catholicism and its rites, and you look at some Kabbalah, and you look at Golden Dawn, and then you look at Chaos Magic, you look at all these different uh, and you know the Masonic uh, rituals. There's a common core to all of those. They they all have something in common. They share elements of each each religion, each rite, each belief system has at its core some very common like it's almost like there's a common ancestor for all of these mystery schools. You guys you guys should watch this too, and you're totally right about that. But you guys should watch this show if you have HBO or like Prime with the HBO subscription. 
there is a show called The Young Pope. It, it's only one season, but it it's really fascinating. Uh, I think it's a good show to watch. Now, what I'm trying if it's on the rise, then that tells me that demon possessions are probably something common. And so, if you look up, and any of you guys can Google this, what what negates, I guess, or what what are symptoms of a demon possession? And here we go. How many of you? I want to know how many of you are possessed by a demon right now. After I read these, number one, low energy levels. Number two, character shifts or mood swings. Number three, your inner voice or voices are speaking to you. Number four, impulsive behavior. Number five, memory problems. Number six, poor concentration. And number seven, sudden onset of physical problems. Right there, so that means everybody over the age of 65 is possessed by a demon. (laughs) Yeah. So I'm sure business is a booming. Well, that's some of the generic ones. I mean, speaking in a language that you don't that you don't know, like uh, in some cases, the possessed will begin to speak in Aramaic, or they will speak in Latin that's reversed. You know, some of the stuff you see in movies like The Exorcist or the the series. Oh, the one I told you about. Um, there's a British series about a, a Vatican exorcist. You know, some of these things. Um, oh, another good one was Stigmata. What oh, yeah. you see in these shows are actually, you know, they don't make that up for the script. They're taking Vatican accounts of exorcisms or, you know, historical accounts and taking the elements from those, those exorcisms and putting them into these shows. So, you know, they're not making it up on the fly. Some of this stuff has actually been documented, some of these behaviors. You know, a person that barely speaks their own language, then they start speaking Aramaic or Latin or, you know, some other exotic language, you know, just by and large, you're not going to pick up overnight. You know, you get things like that. Uh, Well, they still want you to, I think they still want a a psychiatric eval before they claim exorcism. Would tell you to get therapy, right? A good one. Mm -hmm. Um, They would. But there is, there is, we got to get this person on the show too. Dr. Edith, I think her name is Dr. Edith Fiore, author of The Unquiet Dead. I'm writing that down right Mm. now. And she says that many people are possessed by earthbound spirits. And these are people that have lived and died, but did not go into the afterworld. Instead, they stayed on earth and remained just like they were before they died uh, with fear and pains and weaknesses and other problems that they had while they were alive. I don't really believe this, by the way, but they are drawn to unite with the living. In fact, they don't even know that they have passed away. Uh, she said most of these victims, uh, most victims of these earthbound spirits become possessed at times of special vulnerability. For instance, uh, if they get emotionally upset or if they get drugged, well, you know what? I think we should, uh, I don't think that can't be true. We can think about how many, when my grandmother passed away, there were no signs other than that Raven. You remember me telling you about that Raven landing on the truck? Yeah. That were that was the only sign I got, and then there was no possession or anything like that. And to say that to me, and maybe you can even chime in on this, it sounds kind of like a, a cop out, unless I'm interpreting this wrong. Because you know, most people, um, most people have low energy right now, especially during this time of the year. I mean, this is the time oh, of the wow. year after Christmas when everybody's kind of lagging around after everything they've ate and all, you know. But exorcisms are on the rise. I mean, I feel well, a little bit low have, energy right now. Well, a lot of people are. I mean, seasonal affective disorder isn't, you know, so I think everybody, the lack of light gets to everybody. I mean, our whole, look at all the religions that are based upon the cycle of the sun. So it obviously has been affecting us as human beings as far back as we can, you know, as far back as memory, you know, race memory provides, it goes back. And it's, it's, we're, 
we're in a low energy part of the yeah, cycle the, right now. Right. Which, by the way, the equi- I can't wait for the, the spring equinox. I'm sure everybody can't wait for that when things, and when it's lighter outside longer. Today was kind of warm, oh, though. I kind of liked it. I like going outside and, and hearing crickets and not being able to walk around without freezing. I don't know how some of you people, especially you Canadians, can stand that stuff. And you come down south where the weather's right. Uh, <laughs> let's see here. Um, I'm trying to find some cool news, man. Wife burns husband alive after he refused to give her his phone password. You got to be kidding me. Burned a guy alive after he refused to give her his phone password. That ought to file under uh, No Hope for Humanity. Right. You know. A wife has been arrested on suspicion of... On suspicion. Give me a break. Allegedly. They have to say that. Burning her husband after the pair got in a fight over his phone password. Didi Pranama was working to repair roof tiles on the couple's home when his wife... Elam Kiani asked for the password to his phone. The 26-year-old husband refused, and the pair got into a fight. This is a bad episode of Cops right here. Mm-hmm. The Lombok police chief made the guy, uh, Pernama, the, or made the guy, I don't know what that means, then climbed down from the roof and hit his wife as the argument continued. Well, you struck her. So... Well, that's yeah, what happened. He kind of got what he had coming. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so that sparked a physical encounter, and Keanu reportedly grabbed a petrol can and poured the flammable liquid over her husband before setting him on fire with a lighter. The reporter's uh, witness identified as OG. These got people have some weird. I think they make up these names. Told reporter he had run over to the scene after spotting the flames to help put him out. But by the time they put him out, he was rushed to the hospital and underwent treatment for two days and died from the burns. He said, well, you shouldn't be hitting girls, dude. I mean, think about uh, it. karma. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can't, I've, I don't think I've ever, the only woman I've ever came close to hitting was my ex-wife, and I still didn't do it. I kind of wanted to, but I just couldn't do it. Don't, don't, I know what you're thinking. But that that stuff happens sometimes. You get angry, and a real dude is not going to strike a woman. He'll restrain himself no matter how mad he gets. And the reason why is is because you might get your ass set on fire. Hell hath no fury. Anyways, uh, I hope we get some stories. Uh, the phone lines are open. Thank you for the email, Paul. I really appreciate that. Speaking of which, tomorrow night, I don't know if I'm going to do this tomorrow night, but I'm for the first time in my life, I'm going to have to pre-record an episode, and I'll tell you why. Justin and Paul from the UK, the the uh, people that do the Dreaming Jaguars channel, are going to take their time out from England and come talk to us about their dimethyltryptamine experiences and their experiences with the psychedelic realm. And so that's going to be another first for this show. And I figured we could even play some clips. Of course, I'm going to have to edit out a lot of cursing, but I love these guys. Uh, but we can even play some clips of as they are going through this stuff because they have several sessions talking about some of the things that they see. All right, that's going to be pretty cool. So I know we're going to be we're supposed to be recording that tomorrow. So I might play it tomorrow night if everything works out all right. But yeah, the call in number is one eight hundred five eight eight zero three three five. You can also email the show at contact at lightingthevoid dot com. You can text in at 501-777-5631. We'll be right back. It's Open Lines. We're here with Mad Men Markham. Stay with us. I don't know why I keep calling you Mad Men Markham. out there there's something out here and so are we ktok digital broadcasting the fringe fm you're listening to lighting the void radio 
Who were the real ancient Egyptians? What is it about ancient Egypt that captivates us all? The critically acclaimed series Magical Egypt is back with all new episodes. Let Chance Gardner and company take you on another adventure through Magical Egypt in the new series Magical Egypt 2. Magical Egypt 2 attempts a forensic reconstruction of the science of the ancients through a study of ancient aesthetics. Also, the best researchers and authors in the field like John Anthony West, Graham Hancock, Laird Scranton, Robert Duvall, Lon Malo Duquette, Aaron Cheek, and more join together to explore the topics of the esoteric and the hidden messages of the ancient Egyptians. Just go to MagicalEgypt.com right now and put in the code word FRINGE and get 10% off any download or order, including the groundbreaking original Magical Egypt series, as well as the new episodes in Magical Egypt 2. Also, check out the great work and the companion series at MagicalEgypt.com. Click the banner on the Fringe FM or go to MagicalEgypt.com and use the code word FRINGE and get 10% off your order today while it lasts. All right, everyone, this is Justin from the UK. Excuse the chitty chitty. If you're into the fringe and you want to hear the brass tacks, my old China plate, Joe Roop, and his guests on Light in the Void will open your mince pies. You need to shut your north and south and use your 10 speed gears and listen to them bubble. You could hear a Barry Crocker, no Brussel, but he ain't no holy fryer. Anyway, you beat a Barnaby Rudge and take a butcher's. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. Hello, this is Vance Nesbitt. Take the time to expand your mind by listening to Lighting the Void with Joe Roop right here on the Fringe FM. Lighting the Void is proud to announce Mind and Magic's Protection and Defense Course for protection from magical and psychic attacks. This is not a joke. Magic practitioners are on the rise, and with that comes attacks from baneful or black magicians that try to harm or hurt others for their own selfish reasons. If you are not a believer in psychic attacks, then this isn't for you. If you are, and you want the power to defend yourself and your family and home, then I highly suggest you grab Freighter Xavier's Protection and Defense Course. In this course, you will learn how to tell if you are under attack from a natural natural source or if an individual is attacking you. The four forms of curses and attacks. How to remove self-imposed curses. The correct way to cleanse your home from negativity or malevolent entities. How to make your own holy water. What you should always keep near or under your bed. Herbs that banish negativity and promote purity. The most powerful banishing rituals on the planet. And for those that seem to want to harm you the most, how to put your enemies in a hell pit of their own making. You can also learn protection against shadow people and other entities. Or are you just in a bad planetary alignment? Even how to get rid of an enemy using a tic-tac box. It does not matter what your faith or belief is. This will work. Click the banner on the website at lightingthevoid.com or go to lightingthevoid.com forward slash Xavier. Hey, folks. Guess what the number one phrase that Life Change Tea receives by email? You ready? We love this tea. We love this tea. Time after time, week after week, we love this tea. Life Change Tea gives you more energy. A beautiful cleansing and fulfills its slogan perfectly. The tea that makes you go. So if you want to be on your health game, log on to getthetea.com and order Life Change Super Strength Tea. Packages come in a one-month supply. And when you brew this stuff, wait until you see the results. Aren't we all about the results? And with a lot of people's health struggling, we can use a little bit of help. Doctors will tell you disease starts in the gut. So log on to getthetea.com. That's getthetea.com. Be our next email saying, I love this tea. I mean, I love this tea. Get the tea at getthetea.com. Helping America one tea bag at a time. Want to know what's on the Fringe FM? Check out our schedule at thefringe.fm.
gotten quite a huge influx of likes on social media. So if you haven't followed the show Lighting the Void or the Fringe FM on social media, make sure you do. Just search the Fringe FM on YouTube. Not YouTube, sorry, but uh, Facebook or Twitter and Lighting the Void on YouTube, Facebook or Twitter. I think we finally broke a 1,000 likes on the Fringe FM. When I say finally, that's pretty good for... Uh, well, I think we went from a few hundred to over a thousand. So that's that's huge in the paranormal world. That's a big deal. So thank you guys so much for your support and your reviews. Uh, we just got through talking to Dr. Irina Scott about her new book, Sacred Corridors. Now Eric Markham is on with us, and we're doing open lines again. The call in number is one eight hundred five eight eight zero three three five. And Cat is on the line with us. How's it going, Cat? Hi, Joe, and hi, Eric. Eric, I wanted to give you my condolences to your mom's passing and send in light and love and energy to her, wherever she may be, and light and love and energy and hugs to you for support. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And um, I loved uh, listening to Dr. Scott tonight because um, I am just digging Project Blue Book show. I read listen or rewatched the first two episodes because I have on demand, which is kind of a nice feature. And um, it's funny because when you, when you watch the first, you know, when you're, when, when I'm watching them, it goes, it, the segments go by so fast, you know, because they chop them up with commercials. And then, so then when I rewatched them, I was like, Oh, I didn't get, I didn't make that connection, you know? So it makes it even more exciting. And I mean, it isn't the exact, um, case as they'll tell you you know it's a reenactment and they do kind of pump it up to make it a little more exciting hollywoodish but i don't mind that it makes it kind of fun um but it's a the cool end, show you know they it is yeah, it's but cool at the to end, see it. they'll they'll say yeah and at the end they'll they'll say they'll t- tell you more and they'll show you the pictures of the real people of that case you know which it's very interesting to do it that way, you know, or they'll say, okay, go here if you want to learn more about that case, which I thought that was kind of a new kind of interactive thing to do with showing, um, you know. I'm old enough to remember the original series, Project Blue Book, back in the day. <laughs> no, they had another oh, really? show? There was another one? Yeah, there was a series back in the um, late 70s called Project Blue Book, starred Kasky huh. Slame, and I don't, I can remember that guy's name because that's weird, you know, it was sort of a weird name, but yeah, they went through and did all the Blue Book, you know, not all, but they did several of the Blue Book files, and of course, you know, they would dramatize it in the first half of the show, and then debunk it in the second half. It's like, oh, that was autokinesis, you, you stared at the light till it looked like it was moving, you know, they... I think there was only one or two in the whole series where it was, dang, you know, that might have been, that might have really been a UFO. But yeah, it was oh, so 76, they were debunk it, maybe huh? 75. Yeah. 70. yeah, well, most of Blue Book was a, a debunking. Right. That's you know, most of, But when the whole thing happened, you know, when the whole thing was done, it was like, okay, they're 98% fake. Or the you know for ninety eight percent of them were explained away, but that two percent I mean they did, whatever I might have the percentages wrong, but there was a certain percent that they could not debunk or explain away. Well, they, so, the last episode I saw mean, where you know, they were talking about the Flatwood monster, and they said it was an owl. You know, that's the last one I saw. Yeah, yeah. that's. No, it wasn't an owl. Though. <laughs> no, it was, I don't think the Plantwoods monster was. There an owl. you go. There's your scientific explanation. Um, no, but it it's it's interesting because um, you know I'm trying to follow back all the different crashes that happened, uh, at least in the U.S. And um, you know there was the L.A. battle, you know, forty two, and then the other one. It was in Missouri, but I can't remember the year. It was in the 40s, and then, of course, Roswell. And then in the Blue Book stuff, this is mostly in the 50s, right? So I find it fascinating, you know, just trying to connect the dots. It's like, what what was going on? Why was there so many crashes or sightings? Like, 
back to back just in those two decades. It, I find that fascinating. Well, then, well there's um, the, one of the explanations for that, supposedly, I've talked with uh, I have a friend, R. Keith Andrews, who's a, a UFO experiencer. And there's a faction, this is the story anyway, there's a faction of UFO people who want us to have this technology. But by the rules of something called the Galactic Federation, yeah, I know, that's, but that's, that's why I was told it was called. Uh-huh. There's this, <laughs> no, you can't, no, yeah. the humans can't have this, uh, this technology. So the only way to really for the faction that wants us to have this technology, the only way they could get away with it is to crash. Well, look here. That sounds great and all. It really does. But I think, I don't know how anybody could know that much about alien races. Unless you're doing dimethyl. Anyways, these guys that are going to come on tomorrow (laughs) night have met beings. Like, they talk about it, man. And one of them is kind of a, I would say a super skeptic, really skeptic about all this stuff, uh, Justin. And he started listening to this show. And even now he says that as we're going on this journey, he's running into some of the same synchronistic experiences. So it's going to be pretty interesting because I think, and I I meant to talk to Dr. Scott about this more, but I know that she takes things from a scientific approach. But there's definitely something to do with uh, some type of consciousness barrier, you know. But anyways, uh, we could talk about that. I do want to hear um, your story, Kat. I know you got one. You know, always call in with a good story. Okay, well, this I this is not my personal story, but I would just like to share it because not everybody has time to read. There's a lot of great stuff coming out, but a lot of people just don't have the time or they don't know where to look. So what I wanted to share was this Sunday is, is the lunar eclipse, but it's also uh, a full moon. They're calling it, you know, the wolf blood moon, all that, wolf right? Wolf moon, yeah. Yeah, but what's fascinating about it in this article that I read recently was that, um, and I know that you're you're into, you know, astrology a little bit with mm-hmm. planet alignment and stuff like that. So, okay, so it's, it's, it's these conjunctions with Pleiades, Sirius, and the Galactic Center. And they're all in this conjunction where they're absolutely pointing to Earth. And then the way the person showed it, they made these corkscrew-type-looking vortexes that come from that system, and then they come down into Earth. And they said that this has never happened ever in the universe, supposedly, this type of alignment, and that all three of them were going to come, they made them like three different colors, and that they were going to be beaming down right on the planet at that same time. So they said that they that had never happened. They don't know what that means, and that if you're into meditation, which I am, a lot of people are, and they do these mass meditations now, that you can help anchor that energy and light on the planet for the good, you know, and that, you know, so everybody can be a part of that, not just, you know, I don't even know if you're going to be able to see it because it's been raining on the West Coast. I know it, man. That's That stuff drives me crazy. Anytime there's a cool astrological event, whether it's a meteor shower or like this, and I go outside and I can't see it because of the nasty weather, I don't like it. I get upset. It pisses me off. Yeah. I wanna, that's when it's I wish I was in a dry place like the desert or something, you know, where I could see yeah. this stuff. But this is supposed to be, you know, it's supposed to be felt everywhere, and it's supposed to be a game changer of shifting energy on the planet um, because, you know, a lot of the woo-woos has been saying for several years that the Earth is going up into a higher frequency, fifth dimension, and all that, right. and it affects everybody else. So this one's supposed to be the next big uh, frequency changer and because it's coming from these other systems. Um, well, it's very cosmic, so. I think, I mean, I, I don't, definitely- I wouldn't call it, I guess you could call it woo-woo, but... That just depends on who's talking about it. Uh, I think we are in an age of enlightenment, so to speak, with certain things, uh, you know, like the Kali Yugas and stuff. And uh, 
there's definitely way more people talking about this than there used to be. It, it, I think we're coming to that age. I just don't know what it means. I don't know if uh, people are talking about this utopian type thing. It could be uh, an age to where we got to make a big decision. I don't know, but it does feel that way. Well, we definitely need something because what I heard, we're kind of in a stalemate with light and dark, <clears throat> good good guys, bad guys. We're in a stalemate. And so the only thing that could possibly tip it, it seems, is it has to come out from the universe. It has to be something. Cosmology has to come outside of our source because people have been doing these mass meditations, you know, for quite a long time now. And I've heard a lot of good stuff, but, you know, the other forces are very strong too. So well, you can bet your it just makes sense. You can bet your butt when that moon out. hits. I know for a fact there's going to be occultists doing rituals, both white and black magicians. I can I'm they always do. They always do on right. this stuff during the equinoxes, the solstices, and any times there's uh, eclipses. They want to channel that that energy if it especially especially if it has to do with the moon. Mm-hmm going to be a weird exactly. weekend. Yeah, I'm going to be wearing my, uh, I've got two meditations to do uh, on Sunday. And so I'm going to be wearing my business because I heard recently uh, when Moulton Howe was giving a talk, she was talking about uh, business, magnesium, and, and, and On her zinc. YouTube channel? Where is she going to be on her on the radio? She was on a show recently, but she was talking about those three elements. And I thought, well, I... I have a necklace that I wear business uh-huh. because I read that it's one of the few elements that actually levitates and that they supposedly have found that in some of the crafts. So oh. it helps you when you meditate supposedly to get you through, uh, you know, higher realms and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, but you're, so you're, you're wearing that. I thought you were going to call in and tell us something about this uh, camping trip you had. You didn't talk about that, yeah. did you? I'm not sure if I want to say that on the air. <laughs> well, you can you can leave out words, you know, leave out parts of it. Come on now. Okay, I won't say exactly where I was. But All right. That's what I don't want to say. Okay, but it was a camping trip in the summer. And um, uh, so I was camping in a tent. What were you doing? And, Pat? um well, it was in a particular place. I don't want to say where it was, but okay. it was a heavy place. And, um, you know, so there was a bunch of some people. Some people were in RV. I was in a tent. Some other people were in a tent. I was actually in a tent alone. And I, I think we all crashed out around 11 or something like that. And uh, I remember falling asleep. And then all of a sudden, I mean, I heard this hugest explosion like a bomb or something. It was just... It rattled the ground, and I jump up, and I look out, and the sky is like full-on electric blue. I mean, everywhere. Wow. And this this white light, and it made this crackling sound, and it kept going and going and going and going. And I was like, what is that? I, to this day, I don't know what it was. I've never seen anything like that. I've never heard that kind of crackling, hissing, like that type of, oh, man. I don't know what that was. but it, How long ago did this happen, this day, you said? Oh, this was like 2013. Okay. But it was out in a campground, a big area, you know. And, uh, yeah, I, I didn't know if that was ours or that was theirs but i didn't know that there was something whatever it was that could actually do something like that so it makes me think of you know all these type of space war energy things that they have out there you know it's it it's sound powerful. like a transformer was blowing up oh but like to the nth degree i mean just i like it went on out for miles and it, yeah, it was scary. I never there's, heard anything like that. There's some hoopla going around the net right now that all these transformers are blowing up across the world because the poles are shifting or there's solar outbursts. You guys think about all that? 
Yeah, and and some of them I heard um, were like 100 years old. They were built 1919. Think that's a coincidence? 100 years old. Yeah, but I mean, don't transformers just go out though? I mean, that stuff happens. I don't know much about it. Maybe Eric can help us out with that. But don't they just blow up sometimes? I had a huge one blow up when I was walking across the uh, shipyard in Newport News. I was by. 50, 60 feet away from it and feel the heat. Yeah, that's that's one of the things David Dare mentions is we ever have a coronal mass ejection like a Carrington event, now it's not just going to be the telegraph wires vibrating. It's going to be these oil-filled transformers blowing up. Of course, if there's no power because the transformers are blown up, <laughs> it, it's going to create a, it's going to create a cascade of failures. Well, you want to so, read something that'll freak yeah. you out. You you guys all know who Dr. Robert Shock is. He's been on the show once. I'd like to have him back to talk about this. But uh, if you get his book, Forgotten Civilization, there is a chapter in there, chapter seven actually, called "Our Not So Eternal Sun." That's not something you want to read if you get scared easily about annihilation. Uh, well, well, yeah, good. <laughs> there's been, there's been, uh, there's been major extinction events along our, the history of our earth. I mean, the, the Cambrian, there was this massive explosion, you know, explosion of life that all pretty much got wiped out at once. Um, it's, it's not unusual for the sun to flare up. We've just been lucky in that we were either, you know, a second or two this way or that way, and it didn't, or, you know, the moon got in the way. Something, you know, something ha- has happened every time here recently that sort of bailed us out, but it could happen. As a matter of fact, we're overdue for an extinction-level coronal mass ejection. You were a burning man, weren't you, Cat? Is that where you were at? You can tell us. Burning man. No, I never went to that. I had a friend that went to it what? years ago. I think it's changed since then, but I've never been to a Burning Man thing. Well, who all is going to go to Burning Man with me and, and do mushrooms and DMT? Am I going to be the only one that's going to do it? <laughs> Eric, you'll know. go, won't you? Yeah, I would probably go just to people watch. <laughs> <laughs> Ruin whatever reputations we have. Right off the bat, uh, no, I probably I, I keep I tend to I tend to be able to keep myself. I'm one of those people who can walk into a room full of strangers, and when I walk out, I, there'll still be a room full of strangers. I can be like unnoticeable, and that's probably how I would be at Burning Man. I would just be watching what was going on. Well, I wouldn't want to be exposed to negative energy. I work too hard to keep up my, you know, my frequencies up high. And, you know, I've heard stories about that. And I just wouldn't want to be exposed to negative stuff that would just draw out everything I work so hard at, you know. That's yeah, my well, thing. It's like, Burning Man seems like it's just one hell of a party. I'd like to go to it. But it I'm is. definitely sure there would be some negativity there. There's always going to be negative people at events i would i would i think i'm thinking about going to contact in the desert you know and uh i'm gonna go out there and do a ritual to freak everybody out so they can talk about it for a year or two (laughs) right i wish (laughs) i I had gone before yeah i wish i had gone before they moved it to the big hotel though I saw Joe Roop and Madman Markham out there we're drawing pentagrams they're they're part of the luciferian (laughs) agenda yeah, you you would never talk to us again, would you, Cat? <laughs> I would do something to make it all good for you, Joe. <laughs> I know you would. Hey, I will say this, and I'll talk. I can talk about it now because you brought it up in the chat room. I went on a shamanic journey with Cat once, and you know how skeptical I was about it, right? Like I, I don't know mm-hmm. if this is going to work or whatever. And you were just like, "Shut up and listen to the drum beat." And it does. It takes you into a. Uh, it, it it takes you into an internal place that I've never been before. So there's something to the shamanic thing. That's why I'm so interested in this. Uh, this whole DMT and ayahuasca thing. That's why we're going to do a show on it. 
Well, you you have to be anchored. You you got to clear, not you in particular, I'm just saying in general, because I know somebody that went to Peru and did it, and they had said that, um, <laughs> you know, she kind of joked about it because she's like, oh, God, everybody was throwing up. That's not much fun. But she also said that the problem is is that you, it brings up whatever a person hasn't dealt with in their psychology, it brings it up. And, and so she noticed that, and that's not fun either. So um, she, you know, she was pretty grounded, but she said a lot of people aren't, and they go doing that for the wrong reason because they don't realize that, you know, their, their uh, demons are going to come out or whatever. And that's not good for a person, you know. They got to deal with that before they feel like they want to go on a higher journey, right? Right. Yeah, I get that. Yeah. So if you're going to do that, you know, do some clearance for yourself and, you know. What are you going to do with you. during this wolf moon? For, oh, well, I'm going to be at the highest place. I'm going to be with the monks, the temple. Uh, so you get to meditate that's, with that's, monks. That's not fair. What what kind of monks are we talking about? Are we talking about Buddhist uh, monks, Buddhist, Christian monks? Buddhist monks, yeah. The Buddhist for Gautama Buddha, um, he all his great um, events that happened in his life, born, enlightenment, death, all happened on full moon. So full, full moons are a big deal to uh, Buddhists. So they meditate on full moons. That's a big ceremony. And it just happens to be during this lunar eclipse. So, uh, you know, when you're meditating with the monks and their life is all about purity, enlightenment, you, you feel that yourself, you know, so you're, and then I try to direct it particularly for, you know, world peace on those days or for myself or for others, you know, I'll try to remember Eric's mom, you know, put some, cause they, they honor the, the dead too. You know, they feel that we always have this figure eight flow connection to our loved ones. You do good things in your life that goes to them. And then they, on the other side, can do things for you. So there's, there's lots of cool things that are going on at the same time. So, yeah, that's what I'll be doing. I'll be meditating with the monks and trying to remember these three vortices and anchoring that on the planet as well. Kat, do you, you, you love me, don't you? Like, in a way, you do love of me, course. right? So, of course. Let me ask you this question. Would you still love me if I went to, uh, during the wolf moon, if I found a crossroads? and invoked Lucifer so I could become famous. <laughs> Is that what you want? I don't know. I don't know. I'm not fame, but I'd like I'd like things to take off a little bit more. And I hear uh, Miley Cyrus has said that you can just talk to Lucifer at a crossroads and get what you want. Like, that's what all the famous yeah, people then do. You're gonna pay, then you're going to pay the price. That worked out so well for so Robert Johnson. <laughs> But the the big the real question is though is would you still love me if I did it? We have to love all beings. Buddhists did. I mean, Buddha had supposedly a, a cousin for forty years that tried to murder him, forty years. But he kept loving him. I mean, this guy kept sending everything he could to Buddha to kill him, and Buddha just kept giving love, giving love, giving love. So finally the guy, you know, in almost deathbed or something, you know, he turned his way, said, I'm sorry and everything. So, I mean, if Buddha can do that, we should be able to too, right? Put, huh. Change the, the dark into light. Watch, if this broadcast ever really takes off, people are going to say, you remember that show where he said he was going to invoke Lucifer? He's a Luciferian now. No. But it's it's real. I mean, I, I thought that was a funny joke about uh, people going to the crossroads like this ritual called the crossroads, you know, the whole bone, do you know who bone thugs and harmony is cat? Do you have any idea who that is? Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Well, they even had a song about it and you know, I collect books on magic and apparently that is a real thing. Uh, you just find a crossroads, uh, invoke Lucifer or Papa Shango or whoever you want to do it with and, uh, give them some whiskey and you don't have to give them your soul. Just give them some whiskey and some food and tell them what you want and you, and you get it. Whether they want in return. That's it. Whisk. Well, from what I hear, you don't. You can give your soul, but you don't have to. You can give Lucifer food, whiskey, admiration, even art. Does that scare you? I don't see why you why it has to be Lucifer. Why can't it be another 
other higher beings. Like angels? Have to do just him. The angels. Or, or extraterrestrial, Lucifer is or an extraterrestrial angel. higher beings. I mean, there's all different kinds of beings. Oh, why just one person? I mean, uh, why, would, okay. why wouldn't you want the choir of angels? Why wouldn't you want a whole retinue of angels? Because Archangels all angels do beings. is they just pet your little head and go, oh, you're so sweet. We love you. <laughs> Well, most angels don't have any free will. Yeah, and they don't. They they just give you what's good for you because they love you. They don't ever give you the bad stuff. Anyways, we got to take our last break. You can stay on the line if you want, Cat. I've got multiple phone lines here. I wonder what everybody's going to be doing. Yeah, definitely hang out with us. But I wonder what everybody's going to be doing during the Wolf Moon this weekend. I am very curious. Let me know. Email me. Probably. Showing up in your emergency room? I hope not. I hope not. But, guys, we do got to take a break. Here's a little Wolf Moon for you. If you remember this song, if any of you top on negative fans out there, it's a little creepy. We'll be, we'll be right back. This is all. I listen to Lighting the Void because it's interactive radio with good content, interesting guests, and a humble host. Sharing his journey through the esoteric. Hey, Joe Roop. Thanks for having us along for the ride. Thank you so much for a delightful evening. Well, I got a lot of ground to cover. This is Aaron Hunter, host of Real Paranormal Activity, the podcast where we tell real paranormal experiences of people from around the world. And we also conduct interviews with authors, investigators, psychics, and mediums. Real people, real stories, real fear. Thursdays at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern on The Fringe FM. See you then. Hey, Fringe FM listeners. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or no Wi-Fi available, you can still listen to every minute of The Fringe FM by calling 701-719-3971. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. Saves your data plan and no extra cost if you have unlimited minutes. Call 701-719-3971. That's 701-719-3971. Listen to The Fringe FM on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Studio 303, it's the Stranger Than Fiction News, right here on the Fringe FM, bringing light to the stories that surround us. German World War I submarine emerges off the French coast. The wreck of a World War I German submarine is gradually resurfacing on the beach in northern France after decades of being buried in the sand. Shifting Sands is exposing the remains of the UC-61, which was stranded there in July of 1917. The crew flooded the vessel and abandoned it. By the 1930s, the submarine had largely been buried. It's now becoming a tourist attraction again, although the local mayor warns it may only be a fleeting visit. Since December, two sections of the submarine have been visible at low tide, which is about 330 feet from the dunes. This story is reported at the BBC. 
And an Australian farmer shares a photo of a possible Tasmanian tiger near Clifton Springs, Victoria. Australian farmer Peter Groves said he was out walking near Clifton Springs in Victoria on January 4th when he encountered an unusual quadruped, according to Groves. He managed to take out his cell phone and snap a picture of the creature, which some are saying is a surviving member of the thylacine species, also known as Tasmanian tiger. Groves said the animal was funny looking and described it as having a big long tail and slumpy ears. Despite any lingering doubts, Grove does believe it is possible he photographed a thylacine. This story was published at the singular com. And residents in a rural area of southeastern Brazil reported a sky full of spiders this week. Hundreds of eight-legged visitors have taken to the air, constructing a huge web ceiling that makes it look as if they are floating in midair. According to experts, hot and humid weather causes the arachnids to go airborne and catch their prey of insects and sometimes small birds. You can watch a disturbing video of these spiders and read the entire article at theguardian.com. And time for this edition's fun fact. In the state of New York, there is a law on the books that it is illegal to sell a house to a buyer if it is haunted without letting them know that first. And that wraps it up for another edition of the Stranger Than Fiction News right here on the Fringe FM. I'm Vance Nesbitt, anchor and news sorcerer. You're listening to Lighting the Void Radio. breaking stuff in here now welcome back to lighting the void i accidentally hit the wrong button i was going to play the lightning flash and hit the glass crash anyways uh it's open lines it's the end of the week here for lighting the void by the way stay tuned after this show ryan gable's coming up if you're listening live from the secret teachings if you're listening on the archives you know share it around tell your pals and your friends about this show and uh Things are going to change. I, I wish I could tell you, but part of the reason why I missed last night is because I had a meeting that I really couldn't miss, not to mention I was exhausted, but I really had to go to this meeting about the show. And when I say things are going to change, I don't mean like I'm going to change or the show name's going to change. It's just going to be a little different, and I think you guys are going to like it. But if you don't, you know I appreciate your feedback. But we are here now with Eric Markham, my partner in crime on the network, and crazy cat one of our listeners who tends to call in with some insane stories sometimes and uh i i really mean that when i i'm talking about this crossroads ritual about lucifer i you know i started out joking about it but the truth is the more i looked into it the more i realized that it's a real thing and i'm not trying to get all illuminati conspiratorial on you but you there are a lot of artists that admit that they did this they don't necessarily say that they offered their soul, but if you look into, I mean, I've got one, of, I've got the ritual here in a book. I just don't know if I should even read it because we all, whoever's listening might actually sell their souls. I don't really know how all that works. So I'm not going to do it, but it, the point is, is it's real. Okay. Artists do these things. They admit that they do these things, that they go to a spirit and say, look, I want to be famous. I don't want to go through the rat race. I want to jump ahead. Here's some whiskey, here's some admiration or some art, or maybe even here's my soul or whatever, and they get it. It works. 
So the real question is, is if you know that something like that works, I want you to be honest with me. If you know that you can have everything of your dreams and desires, and all you have to do is call upon some Papa Shango or Lucifer at a crossroads, would you do it? I want to know. Don't ask me why I want to know. I'll ask you first, Eric. Would you do it? Mm, at this age, probably not. I'm too old to enjoy it. Now, had I known how to do that when I was 18, 19, you bet your bippy I would have. What is the one thing that you desire <laughs> right now that before you leave this earth that you want but you don't think you'll get? You can tell us. A new healthy body, right? We all want new healthy bodies. Is that what you want, Ken? <laughs> no, I'm, no, I'm no, kind of you bored. Want to do it all I'm not over bored, again. but... Yeah I, would, yeah, I would like to go back. I would like to go back to about seven years old with the knowledge I have now. No, that's not what I'm to... talking about, though. You know I can't. He, there's only so many things Lucifer can do for you, all right? You're getting unreasonable. But, but, no, I'm just playing. Uh, what what about you, Kat? Would you, first off, before you give me the high moral ground here, share with us. What? Just be real with us. Is there something that you desire that you don't think you'll ever have, but you could have if everything, if the stars aligned? What would that be? Would it be money, fame? Super famous oh, well, boyfriend, you know, a healthy I've always, body. I've always been a real. I've always been a real ele- environmental elemental person. Very mm-hmm. connected to animals, so I feel them and what goes on on this planet. And you know, I know I know a lot of them have left. And um, you know, when I'm out in another state, you know, I'm around more wild animals. So for me, it can never be just about me. You know, because they are me, I am them. They're, I'm all connected. So I would always want the earth to be back pristine again. Now, could that ever happen again? I don't know. Does the, does the earth, does the whole surface of the planet have to get, you know, demolished like Noah's flood for, for it to come back again? You know, I mean, I don't know. That's Look, I would, you guys that's are... what I would love. I would love to... If I got to leave the planet, I'd like to go to a planet like Earth, but it's pristine. Okay. So, all right. So, if you could go to a crossroads and ask Lucifer, say, look, and he, you know he would do it for you, I will take you to a planet full of beauty, love, and animals or whatever. This, you're taking the fun out of this. But what I'm saying is, <laughs> is would you do it? You don't have to sell no, your soul. All I, you got to do is give him a little bit of whiskey and food. No, because I know that it nothing's for free. Nothing. Everything, it you know, has a – you have to pay a price for everything. I mean, you know, just getting up out of your bed, you got to pay a price. You know, everything, you know, so it's That's not that easy. Alchemy, it's, yeah. it's not that easy. Just to ask, you know – a being, okay, give me all this, you know, no. There's but it a price is. to pay. It, I mean, there were Twilight Zone episodes about that. Yeah. The, the well, genie, I mean, the genie in the lamp and it guy. never works right. <laughs> right. Oh, what? my God, the guy that just wanted to read books and so the end of the world he gets all the books, but then his eyeglasses break. <laughs> Time yeah. enough at last. My favorite episode. Burgess Meredith. Yeah, I love to read too. That, so no, that is so me. Is. I mean, that so, would be. Oh my God! I got all my. I finally got all the time I ever needed to do all the reading I wanted to. Do. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, so, no, Joe. I don't think it works that way. I, I really don't think it works that way. You know, people don't really know who you really are, right? Like most people <laughs> don't know you who you really are. You could be honest with me. Who's the hottest man? Who do you think is the hottest man on the planet? Alive? Alive. 
I don't know. You know, people don't really look the way that they really are, though. Oh my gosh, so you are so. You're like a you're like a, a nun, but not a Christian nun. You're like a, a nun. You're so contrary. <laughs> you're a square. I love you though. I I need a human being to call in and tell me what they would sell for Lucifer. You you guys are you guys are already ascended masters, I guess. Right, look, what if I told you that this whole thing about hell and your eternal soul it was going to burn and you would? What if I told you all that was bull crap? But the power of Lucifer was real. Would you still consider? Well, why? It? Why is it so important? Why is it so important to you? Let me turn it on you. Why because so I know somebody's not telling me the truth in this little group here. I just got to figure out who it is. Somebody's taking the moral high ground. That's not what we do here. No, no, I'm not really taking the moral high ground. It's just the things that I just can't think of too much. To ask for, okay, I guess if I could ask for something, I would want to be able to jam with uh, Joe Satriani, keep up, you know, do the G3 concert tour with Joe Satriani and Steve Vai. I'd like to be the third guitarist or be able to hold my own on a stage with, you know, Eric Johnson. Just, you know, pick a guitar master, Al DiMiola. I'd like to be able to play my instrument in that that category. That would probably be the thing that I would ask, you know, at the crossroads. There you go. Now that that has been done. But now, but now, yeah, it, and it you know Robert Johnson did that, and it, you know, a few years later he was dead. But that doesn't That's mean Lucifer. It, Lucifer killed him. He could have just died. Well, you know. No, he was poisoned. <laughs> I just, I don't know. I feel like part think- of the, the struggle is part of what makes music precious to me. Because to, honestly, folks, I friggin' suck at it. What if the Satriani, how do you know they didn't go to Lucifer? Note. Well, if they did, more power to, well, you know, they're not real. Joe Satriani's not very, for all his talent and what, you know, he's not a wealthy man. Alan, uh, he just passed recently, Alan Holdsworth, probably one of the foremost in his genre, was damn near a pauper. You know, these people, if they sold their souls for this technical wizardry on guitar, they didn't get much other than the guitar. You know, the that technical wizardry is all they got. You know, I'm wondering if that's not the payback. You know, the, you always have the good and the bad, okay, here you can you know you can play like Joe Satriani. You can hold your own. You know you have here's your music. Okay, am I going to enjoy it if I don't struggle for every note? Of course you if are. If all of a sudden I can just sit there and whip out Cliff Dover, it's not going to have the same meaning because I don't have to put any. I don't have any skin in the game. It became automatic. All of a sudden I'm this virtuoso on a guitar without the struggle. Without the quest, it's sort of empty. So I think it would probably ruin. I probably if, if that was bestowed on me, the consequence would probably be, eh, this isn't as much fun as I thought it'd be. I don't know about all that, man. And you know the weird thing is, is I can't find the ritual. I have it here on paper. The same ritual probably Bone Thugs and Harmony used, probably uh what's his name? Uh they can't think of his name. There's four or five rock stars and about ten blues artists that have admitted yeah. to selling their soul at the crossroads to the devil without laughing or winking and being very serious about it. And they all are very famous and they all sold a lot of records. And I can't Well, they, you look at the history of Robert Johnson. He was a nobody. He did the ritual. Next thing you know, he's the hottest blues player in the United States. Then again, he dies when he's, what, 27? There's a thing called the 27 Club. All these, like Amy Winehouse, uh, Robert Johnson, I believe, uh, oh, Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin. You, you've got all these people. They were big in. Do we lose Eric? Oh God, we lost Eric. See, 
That's what happens when you lie about Lucifer. <laughs> Are you back? <laughs> Eric? Yeah. Okay. I'm here. We lost your connection I'm for here. a second. Oh, okay. So, I don't know jo- if I heard so my Joe, if you about get all this fame, what are you going to do? <laughs> well, I don't know that. I don't know. I, I really don't. It's not the fame that I'm after. I, I just want to be able to get out of the shack and have a decent radio studio. And, uh, you know, if Lucifer, the bringer of light, was there, he said, look, all you got to do is give me some whiskey and maybe a little bit of food. Tell me I'm cool, and I'll get you out of that raggedy studio and put you in something different. Hmm. I wouldn't, yeah. no, you're right. I wouldn't do it because I, you know what? I wouldn't be happy. No, because then because I'd have to go look for you and save your soul. I wouldn't be happy because <laughs> I didn't have to struggle to get the equipment and it wouldn't feel as, come on now. Look. No, there's a difference. No, there's a difference between something like having music, you know, musical ability and having material stuff. You know, there's there's a difference. There we go. Moon said, "I know Moon will do it." But here's the thing: for a long time, I'm just being real with you here. The devil has fulfilled oh, this role for people in in real life, and everybody thinks that Lucifer is some big terrifying monster. But if you really look into the stories, he's nothing but a beautiful truth bringer. And that what Jay Z said. More like a bothersome creature rather than just this gigantic evil guy. Well, not if you suffer afterwards. If you get what you want, but then you suffer. I mean, no, that's not a good thing. Yeah, well, nobody's going to suffer. How many people are so in touch with themselves, though, that they... I think where Lucifer gets the bad rap is he get you know, people say, oh, I want this, thinking that's what their heart's desire was. Then when they get it, they realize, well, that wasn't really their heart's desire, right? Or it, or it's flat. It's yeah. not right. It's like that great Christmas because present you can't wait for. You finally get it. You open it up. You play with it for five minutes. It, it sits in the closet for the rest of your life. I kind of feel like he plays that game with us. You know, in my case, I'd want to put, you know, insane guitar skills. And then when I got them, because I didn't have to do anything to earn them and they just came automatically, I think I would get bored. You know what it is about that that process, though, that these guys are doing that bothers me? It isn't talking to Lucifer. It isn't talking to the great archangel of the deep, you know, oh, what's this? He's got the morning star, the most beautiful angel. But Lucifer in mythology, and this especially in magic, is known for the fastest and quickest and most powerful material manifester of all the spirits, right? It isn't that person that bothers me. It's going out to a crossroads in the middle of the night by yourself and invoking the some bitch. That's scary to me. Does that make sense? Like, you can't even bring your friends. You guys can look this stuff up. The ritual's real. But you got to go out there. you got to find a crossroads that is, uh, it, it could be any crossroads. doesn't matter. And there's a process to it. But you got to go by yourself all alone. I'm afraid of the dark. I'm not afraid of Lucifer. I'm afraid of the dark. I wouldn't be able to do it. That's my answer. And I'm probably being the most honest with all of you right now. I want you guys to know that they're listening. You get 100% authenticity. I will admit my faults. Not afraid of Lucifer. I'd probably talk to him. I'm afraid of being in the dark with Lucifer. That's a fact. I mean, I can't be the only girl who's scared out, of the dark. I think if you started out there in the dark alone, did the invocation, and then, you know, all of a sudden you're not alone. It'd be first, it's like, oh, crap, this really worked. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then, then the fright of who you were alone in the dark with. Yeah, I, I kind of, the dark has, no, I, I'm really not afraid of the dark anymore. Uh, I probably was up until I was about 16. And uh, I'm no longer afraid of the dark. In fact, I relish the dark, but I'm usually alone in the dark. And if 
somebody, if I thought mm. I was alone in the dark and all of a sudden found out I wasn't. Isn't that a Pat Benatar yeah. song? Promises in the Dark? What? Uh, not my genre. I'm not sure. Oh, like, what? No, I'm not a big Pat Benatar I thought you fan. were a rocker, dude. You don't know who Pat Benatar is? I know who she is, but she's not what I call her. She doesn't fit into my category of rock. Promises. In, you I know, mean, know, I know, you know who Pat Benatar is, she's don't you? Considered, but... What's that? You know who Pat Benatar is, don't you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Promises in the dark. See, at least I think maybe Pat Benatar maybe made a deal with the devil. Is that what do you think? Didn't she, didn't she end up marrying like the governor of Kentucky or something like that? I don't know. Here we go. Promises in the dark by Pat Benatar. Let's see if she's singing know. to the devil. She's got a nice, tight pantsuit on, though. This has got to be 70s. I'm going to have to delete this old on YouTube. Hmm. Sing with me, Eric. No Never Pat Benatar fans song. here, right? You guys aren't rockers, man. Yeah, that's, that's I don't remember that one. That wasn't one of her biggest hits. Whatever. Promises in the dark. What is it? What's the other one? Fire and ice. Ah, you're but you're awesome, yeah. Joe. <laughs> you guys don't know <laughs> music, man. Dark. You know why awesome? Have to be dark. Oh, they're yeah, they're that's not a. Yeah. You guys are no fun, man. You won't talk to Lucifer. You don't like Pat Benatar. What am I doing here? We do got to get out There's of here. There's other kinds of fun. It's not this dark. Well, I was just well, wondering. I'm just letting... Too. Look, I'm just letting you guys know. I'm not saying the only fun is dark. I'm just letting you guys know that a lot of people did make a deal with the devil. They admitted it. Go check it out. Of when course. this show's over, if you're awake, go look it up. You'll see all of these artists admitting it. They're not blinking. They're not laughing. They went to the crossroads, sold their soul to the devil, and they're big and famous. Now, I want you to look around, particularly at artists who's named their music after evil things and talk about, like, blackness and darkness. I don't do that. My show's called Lighting the Void. We light up the dark. We don't go into it. We didn't sell our souls here. I'm just trying to see who's honest and who's not. And so far, the only honest well, people I know for sure are in the chat room, like Jan and Moon. You guys don't want anybody to think bad about you. I know what's going on here. I know. What about the Caesars of the Rome? Oh, my gosh. I need to turn this off. We got to get out of here, though. Thank you for calling, Kat. You know I'm just playing with you guys, right? Oh, you're welcome. Hell is for yeah, children. A That's a good one, too. Guys. Uh. But, yeah, if you're listening, The Secret Teachings with Ryan Gable's coming on. Don't worry. Nobody's going to be talking to Lucifer during the Wolf Moon. I was just seeing if people were going to be legit with me or not, and I think everybody was. We had fun. I uh, might be on tomorrow night. I don't know, but for sure we'll be back next week. And this show was produced by the Fringe FM and cannot be rebroadcasted or syndicated without room permission. And music was by Chronox, Kevin McLeod, Space Station, and copyrighted music was by Pat Benatar. And uh, tap on negative, but we'll delete that out for the archives. Love you guys. See you next week. Good night.